for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. How you doing? Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, man. How you doing? Today's Monday, May 16th, 2022 for KJCR, the Game Changer, and NX Networks. Raise Hobbs. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Let's do this. <laughs> Tonight, kicking off another amazing week here on Fade to Black, we welcome very special guest, John Michael Godier is with us, author and host of The Event Horizon. Tomorrow night, Jay Widener is here. We're going for tomorrow night. It's a full evening of the esoteric Wednesday night. Big night here on Fade to Black, just like tonight, Randall Nickerson joins us for the first time. We're going to be discussing his new film. It is called Ariel Phenomenon. I have seen it. The world premiere is on May 20th. He's going to be here exclusively on the 18th, Wednesday. Thursday is another Fader night with open lines all night long. Another great week coming up here on Fade to Black. A couple of announcements really quick. We have sold out our tour in Egypt this October with Billy Carson. I look forward to hanging out with the 80 friends that were lucky enough to uh, to get things arranged. And uh, that's it. It is sold out. All right. I will be in Detroit with Billy Carson, though, coming up on June 5th. For the world premiere of uh, Billy's new movie, uh, The Black Knight. And uh, so that's June 5th. And I posted out on uh, social media today. And I think I've got it in the links below. If you're in the Detroit area, uh, Indiana, Ohio, right? And you want to come to the premiere, uh, which is Sunday night, June 5th. uh, There is a way to get tickets and come in and hang out with us. So that is coming up in just a couple of weeks in Detroit. Uh, Really looking forward to that. And I will be hosting Disclosure Fest, uh, also coming up in uh, a few short weeks, Saturday, June 18th, right here in Los Angeles, California, downtown at the Los Angeles State Historic Park. This is the largest event for our community in the world. We will... We are anticipating another 20,000 people at this event, and I get to host it. It's just absolutely amazing. So I'll see you there. And uh, tickets and information, DisclosureFest.org. Like I said, links for everything is in the description box below, over on our website, and throughout social media. I was, uh, this weekend uh, was pretty amazing. Um, Last night... I went uh, over to Caroline Corey's uh, little uh, get-together for the premiere of her new film, uh, Terror in the Sky, and uh, that was a lot of fun. But last night was also the uh, lunar eclipse with the red moon, and I posted, I, I couldn't help myself, so after, uh, I had to get back uh, to get to work last night, right, had stuff to do. And I'm on the freeway uh, driving back, and I knew that the red moon 
uh, this eclipse was going to start here in Los Angeles at around 830. And I'm on the freeway and I make a couple of turns on the freeway. All of a sudden, right in front of me, boom, I had never seen anything like it. And I didn't know what to do. So what do you do at a moment like that? You live stream on Facebook. That's what you do. <laughs> so I fired up the phone and I'm driving on the freeway, live streaming the red moon. And I have never seen anything like it in my life. Now, uh, there are a couple of live streams that are still up over on my Facebook channel. And I guess I'll leave them up there. It's not that big of a deal. But anyway, they're they're there if you want to see what I'm talking about. And I'm trying to keep, you know, I'm trying to stay in my lane. I'm live streaming this. And I cannot believe, to me, this is a once-in-a-lifetime event. You've never seen anything like this. You always, it's a blue moon. It's a red moon. It's a this moon. It's a wolf moon. You hear it all the time. When What I saw last night and, you know, the rest of the world what I saw last night was simply incredible, bright red with the shadow moving across it. So I live stream that, and then uh, I pull into my driveway. Man, I'm just like in the garage, close the door, running through, went out in the backyard, and it was behind the trees in the backyard. I was like, oh, man. So I run upstairs, get on the, the patio uh, on the second floor, and I go, and there it is. And I just started live streaming again. It was so exciting to see. Now, here's the deal. This was the crazy thing about last night for me. I've never seen anything like it. So because of this eclipse going on, and yeah, the moon was red, but it was gone, right? It was, you know, with this shadow on it. It was crazy. It was black. I could You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And uh, I even live streamed that. I said, look at, look at my neighbor. He can't see anything. Everything is so black. And uh, about an hour later, uh, when I watched the full eclipse go across and everything go black, and then it ended, the moon was so bleep and bright. I went outside at about 11 o'clock, and it was like 12 noon in the middle of the day. Everything was lit. I, I I couldn't believe it. So these two extremes happened last night uh, emotionally, man. I was just like, I was I was freaking out, and it, it was all in the live stream. <laughs> I mean, I haven't gone back and listened to it, but I I realized what was coming out of my mouth, man. I I was so blown away. So what a great weekend. Um, and lining up everything for this week, uh, just excited and, and just in a great mood. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Uh, simple enough to do. The sandbox is hashtag F2B on Twitter. And that, of course, is always live. It's right in front of me, right here. And uh, so a hashtag F2B is the sandbox. And uh, I'll follow along in the chats and everything else like I do every night live during the show. And any question or comments, hashtag F2BQ. I've got lots to go through tonight in the breaking news. Uh, and certainly tomorrow is a big day. Tomorrow's two-hour congressional committee hearing on UFOs has been moved ahead one hour. Now it's going to start at 6 a.m. Pacific time 9 a.m. Eastern time. If you had your clock set, uh, you need to check it because now it has been moved up an hour. Now, in addition to C-SPAN, you can also watch it live at space.com or at the U.S. House Intelligence Committee YouTube channel. All right. Now, if you have difficulties, we'll get it up in social media uh, uh, to greet you in the morning to make sure you don't miss anything. All right. Now, Ukraine. Ukraine has won Eurovision 2022 and a victory that was for the politics of music. Their entry was favored to win the 2022 grand final as much on sympathy as it was on merit. And to me, that's just fine. 
And with Russia banned this year, Ukraine's entry was going to win the 2022 grand finale, no matter what, as expected, though the professional juries, mostly backed by other countries, the popular vote went overwhelmingly for Ukraine, giving it the win. All right. Now, McDonald's, this is crazy to me. McDonald's is closing its doors in Russia. Now, we already heard the news about this, but today it went a step further. Remember the crazy when McDonald's opened on Red Square in Moscow? You remember that? The drama? Well, those days are officially over. The Chicago burger giant confirmed today that it is selling all of its 850 restaurants in Russia. McDonald's said it will seek a buyer who will employ its 62,000 workers and will continue to pay those workers until the deal closes. Incredible. Then there was this headline this morning over on MSN. Are you ready? This was the headline. Man says that he has been abducted by aliens 60 times and forced to fight in their army. That was the headline over at MSN. Now, the deep dive into the article reveals that Russ Kellett, a 58-year-old from North Yorkshire, United Kingdom, claims he has been abducted by aliens no less than 60 times and says that he has been fighting for a race of 15-foot-tall aliens since he was 28 years old. That's right. And yes, Russ is quoted here, and I quote, For the past 30 years, I have been part of their army fighting the opposing race of aliens, the Dragos, which are tall and scaly, and they have heads like dragons. End quote. <laughs> Russ Russ also described a room covered in checks like a chessboard as the place where he goes whenever he is abducted. That's right. He said that he and his alien comrades use a glass ball located in the middle of this room, which can transport them through space and time. Isn't that special? Mr. Kellett thinks that he now has chronic fatigue syndrome and post-traumatic stress disorder from his time involved in the space wars. That's right. On top of this, Mr. Kellett suspects that his memory has been wiped by aliens who do not want him to remember fighting for them, which may affect his application for disability and early retirement. I'm just going to leave that right there. A massive military parade in North Korea has now been identified as the COVID-19 super spreader event after several servicemen who marched in it tested positive for the virus. Held on April 25th to commemorate the operation that started 90 years ago and grew into the country's military, the parade brought together 20,000 soldiers. At the time, North Korea was still claiming that it was 100% virus-free. Well, this week, Pyongyang finally confirmed that COVID is spreading across the country. Their leader, Kim Fatty Fat, has since declared that their super cool maximum emergency epidemic prevention system is in effect. That's his words, not mine. Let's get this show cracking on this day in history, OTD. 1717, satirical writer Voltaire is imprisoned in the Bastille for the next year just because he was a great writer. Here's your fader fact today. All right? I love my fader facts. I wonder if uh, John Michael knows about this. In Nepal... There is a type of honey made made by bees called mad honey. It has a reddish color and a slightly bitter taste. And it's hallucinogenic. That's right. A small jar will set you back 
about a hundred bucks. <laughs> Mad honey. And that is your fader fact. Tonight we welcome very special guest, John Michael Godier. He is an author and of course the host of the event horizon. It's going to be a great conversation. One that I tried to start like four years ago. <laughs> we finally got it done tonight. John Michael's with us tomorrow night. Jay Widener is here. We are going for a full evening of the esoteric. And what I would suggest, because I think you're using that word the wrong way. What is the definition of esoteric? Look it up. And that's what we are doing tomorrow night. Wednesday night, Randall Nichol Nickerson is here. We're going to be discussing his new film that he directed. It's called Ariel Phenomenon. Um, I've watched the film now three times. And it's amazing. And uh, it is about those school children in Africa. It's an incredible film. Uh, the world premiere is on May 20th. And then Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. Now, you know what time it is. Time for me to hit this. River Moon Coffee. Mm. One of these days... RiverMoonWellness.com. Links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. They're down below. Go get yourself the best coffee in the world. One of these days, I'm going to shoot a video. I'm going to shoot a video of the process that I go through. The ceremony of coffee. And you will see the fade to black blend. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to do it. It's the best coffee in the world. All right. Love my job. I get to drink coffee and hang out with Jean Michael Godier. All right. Now he'll be with us at the bottom of the hour. Um, I gotta talk to you for a second. So I need everybody to just sit down and listen, listen to me. When I'm done and you are wanting to send me an email, don't. All right, but you're going to be coming. Some of you out there are going to be going, what? <laughs> Save it. Okay. All right. Listen to me. The United States has been working on new encryption standards meant to withstand the powers of quantum computing a new technology that will supposedly involve machines capable of crazy mathematical calculations that can crack current day encryption algorithms in seconds, not days, not weeks. Now, the national Institute of technical standards, otherwise known as NIST has been holding competitions to help develop these new standards. Their goal is to develop better, more hack-resistant public key cryptography, which will secure communications for email and other everyday online applications that millions of Americans use every single day. That's me, and that's you. The National Security Agency, the NSA, has also been helping out. <laughs> that's right. With the development of these new encryption standards, I'm not joking. I'm talking about the NSA. Now, stay with me. The NSA says and swears that the new protocols are so secure that even it, the NSA, can't hack them. The NSA also says that they would never, ever put a backdoor in an encryption standard. Again, their words, not mine. Rob Joyce, the NSA's director of cybersecurity, says, and I quote, there are no backdoors. Those candidate algorithms that NIST is running the competitions on 
all appear strong, secure, and what we need for quantum resistance. We've worked against all of them to make sure that they are solid, end quote. Now, Rob Joyce didn't take things further. He just left it at that. Are you buying that? Seriously. Well, you know, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> Though I have to say that the NSA does not have, well, they don't have an amazing track record when it comes to backdoors. I'm just, I'm just saying that right now publicly. That's right. So, let's review some of the facts. <laughs> Fact number one. In 2013, the NSA paid $10 million, and I'll repeat that. In 2013, the NSA paid $10 million to the security company RSA in exchange for which RSA implanted a compromised encryption algorithm into its products. Software called Dual EC DRBG. This algorithm acted as a backdoor for the NSA. That's a fact. Fact number two. In 2014, the NSA had been intercepting U.S.-made Apple and other products, intercepting U.S.-made hardware that was being sent abroad. That's right. It's in the mail system. They grabbed it. They know who it's being sent to. They took it. NSA operatives opened the boxes and would implant the products with back doors, repackage them, and then send them on their way. When the new stuff arrived, it was unboxed, installed, fired up, and brought online. It's fact number two. Fact number three. In 2015, networking products manufacturer Juniper Networks announced that a backdoor had been discovered inside the operating system that runs its firewalls. The NSA is long suspected of having been involved for security weaknesses that allowed hackers to get inside these devices. Fact number four. In 2020, Congress tried to get a straight answer out of the NSA as to whether it was still planting backdoors in U.S.-made hardware and software, those Apple products I was just talking about. The NSA staffer, Ann Neuberger, said, and I quote, we don't share specific processes and procedures. Hmm, that's right. She didn't say no. Fact number five. In February of this year, a few months ago, a backdoor affecting most Linux distributions had been discovered. The backdoor, dubbed BVP47, was linked to the Equation Group, one of the hacking groups inside of the NSA. Now, being able to encrypt your stuff today seems pretty normal, and it's also pretty easy to do. But the downside to this, which is always something that I've thought about, is that if I can do it, anybody can, which includes the criminals and terrorists of the world. My email and text about UFOs and great Italian food are my own. And the only people I want reading them are me and the person that I've sent it to. That's it. I expect a certain amount of privacy. And today, you have to take things to another level to get it. It's the world we live in. But, and this is where things get a little murky. But, 
if someone or some group out there is planning something bad, I guess I would expect the NSA to be able to intercept and read these communications, right? So where do we draw the line? Or can we? The response from the NSA about all of this should have been an honest one. You know, something like, you know, of course the NSA can crack encryptions. All of them. And we do install hardware and software when it's needed. We will stay one step ahead of the bad guys. We're not interested in spying on citizens. We don't have time to do that. But if we are focused on a person or group, we have the tools to keep people safe. That's what the NSA would have, should have said. And that's okay. Listen, NSA, don't tell us you don't do it. <laughs> I mean, any sane person would expect you to do it and would want you to do it. The alternative isn't a good one. I know that there will be someone out there who's going to say, Jimmy, slow down. How can you support the NSA spying on us? Well, I don't support that. But anyone who tries to say this kind of dribble will be the first one to yell. You know, when some groups does something nasty, They'll be the first one to say, why didn't we know about this? Why didn't anybody do anything about this? How, how did this go unnoticed? Right? That's a fact. You know, I'm not going down the road with, you know, terrorists have rights too, man. No, they don't. Now, I seriously doubt that the NSA gives a crap about my communications or yours. They're not interested in about your cat videos. But one thing is for sure. I didn't build this tech world that we live in, and I can't change it either. I just have to deal with it. And so does the NSA, the FBI, and your local law enforcement. Now, I better make sure right now that I have the latest updates for <laughs> whose encryption protocol is used by WhatsApp, Facebook, Skype, and Twitter. I want the same encryption that the bad guys use. Seriously. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, coming up, John Michael Godier. He's right here. He's in the green room. He's set. He's ready to go. This is Fade to Black. Tomorrow night, Jay Widener is here. All right, Wednesday night, Randall Nickerson joins us. And then Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church on the Game Changer and Unex Networks. This is Fade to Black. I'll be right back with our guest, Shawn Michael Godier. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you know who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. 
artisan, small batch, roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Do you have an interest in the paranormal? Then you'll love the unxnetwork.com. The X is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural, strange, and mysterious, like UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, and so much more. From hosts like Jimmy Church, Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, and Christina Gomez, visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the X. Be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Manson, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Jean Michael Godier is with us, author and host of The Event Horizon. Tonight's going to be a full conversation. We're going to cover the universe, alien life, and what may be visiting our beautiful blue planet. Jean Michael is a science fiction author and futurist with two novels out The Salvagers and Supermind. And he is the host, of course, of two YouTube channels, his personal one under its own name, and that science-based talk show, The Event Horizon, where he interviews guests on subjects ranging from astrophysics, exoplanets, alien life, the Fermi Paradox, and his content is also available as a podcast on Spotify and Apple. I would wel- like to welcome for the first time to Fade to Black, the one and only, John michael Godier. You made it. Jimmy, good to be here. Finally, finally. We've only been talking about this for years. Hey, I got a story for you. So I, I used the bathroom about uh, 10 minutes ago. I'm in the Event Horizon studio here, and I saw one of the world's most poisonous spiders, a black widow. And I didn't, get, I didn't kill him. I left him. But um, if I go down, man, you know, you see me drop off this camera, you know what happened. The other day, I live in the desert, right? I live in the Mojave Desert. Uh, which is not an exaggeration, right? I'm right in the middle of it. And uh, and I'm walking out, it's about two weeks ago, and we've got all those critters out here. I'm walking uh, out onto the patio through my sliding glass door, and I didn't walk through the sliding glass door. I opened it first. But anyway, a spider web went right across my face, and which, you know, kind of creeps you out. It was one string, and I look up, and right, man, Black Widow, this I mean, right above my head, and uh, I got to tell you, man, I'm not really afraid of Black Widows until you see one like this, and uh, yeah, yeah. And now I, I grabbed a broom, grabbed her, and and took her out to the yard and and cast her a boot. You know, away she went. But man, the adrenaline rush. Well, you've got you've got all kinds of nasties running around there. I uh, I was out at uh, Palm Springs for an astronomy function, you know, a tour basically, and I was one of the quote unquote celebrities. And man, we were walking around with like this EV flashlight, looking at these scorpions out there, and they were like warning me about sidewinders. And it's like midnight and pitch black, right in the middle of Joshua Tree National Park, and um, I'm like, God, 
I want to get back to Missouri. <laughs> it's there. Right. We only have two poisonous things. They're every you whip out the black light and see because you can't, you know, it's nighttime. You you don't know what's going on out there. You take out that black light and you're like, I'm walking through this. Mm. Oh man. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's 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 amazing here in the desert and and the birds and and the lizards and the things. Uh, they own this planet. You and I are just visiting, you know, yeah. and that's 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 the way it is. Now, before we get started, you get the first time guest disclaimer. I've been waiting to do this with you for a number of years, and the disclaimer is this: John, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you yeah. go. All right, well, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, a couple of things before I do all the normal stuff, which is who was your crazy uncle that got you started in this when you were five years old? We'll, we'll get to that question, I promise. Um, but I do want to point out to everybody that, as you know, John, I've been a huge fan of Isaac Arthur since he got started, and he's been a guest on the show many times. And so I'm going to I'm going to take a guess here, but I'm going to say it was probably about four years ago, and I listened to you uh, for the first time uh, with Isaac, and I went, I know this guy, I, I know this guy. Okay, wait a minute here, I got to get him on the show. So I, I get a hold of Isaac. Isaac's like, man, John's cool. Yeah, yeah, he's cool. I said, okay. I send you an email, and uh, and you wrote me back. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, it, would, it fell through the it fell through the cracks, but, but uh, that, that's not surprising for me because I get enormous, as I'm sure you do, enormous amounts of email and things slip my mind. I've got a one track mind, and I'm 46, so getting now, along I, in years. I, I, I realize that right now you're uncomfortable because I threw you under the bus. But, <laughs> but the story's got a good ending in that um, last week. Um, it just so happened that your name was brought up on the show and your producers listening to the show mm -hmm. and you listen to the show too. Yeah, absolutely. I've been I listening listen, for years, Jimmy. Yeah. And I, I, I steal all my best stuff from you. So, <laughs> steal so, away. Cause I, but, I, most of it, I steal myself. <laughs> so, so anyway, your producers listening to the show and then I get this email from you. Hey, Jimmy, man, sorry for the delay. <laughs> right? And you sent me <laughs> the original email from four years ago. Yep. And it was just so funny. I read through that. and I thought, man, everything that I thought about that egotistical, he doesn't have time for me. You know, <laughs> um, no, it was just it's it's I did not. Ex what happened to me regarding you know, the shows that I do and everything like that was unexpected. And I was sort of uh, still in a period of, uh, like we talked privately, I'm still in a period or was still in a period of like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I, I was also unaccustomed to having so much to do. In other words, constantly people contacting me and, you know, even advertisers and things like that. I'm like, it, this should be harder than it is. So I, I was sort of in a, uh, a different position. The other, the other problem too at the time was my father died. So, oh, I, had sorry to, I had things to deal with and estates and things like that. So there was just a lot of stress. But I definitely meant to come on, and I want to. Uh, I'll definitely come back. It's just, um, it's just that, uh, yeah, I had a bad, rough, a little bit of a rough way there. Well, it, now let's let's actually uh, talk about things uh, a little bit about the event horizon. Um, and then I'm going to get to your crazy uncle. Okay, we'll we'll get to that part. I am my own crazy uncle. <laughs> so, in if uh, this is a two part question, I'm going to ask both at the same time, and that is when you first started the Event Horizon because it's got you know it's got an enormous amount of respect and and how much of the science that you do cover and it's it's so well done for sure and the production value, but were there subjects that you simply would not go into back UFOs. then because you were worried about respect, right? UFOs. And, and, and then <laughs> UFOs. And then uh, uh, let's fast forward to today. Are there still zones that you won't go into? Nope. Um, there, the, what, what defines it 
what defined the UFO phenomenon was the stigma, right? And I cannot, not, not since the U.S. government reports and the investigations and Barack Obama coming out and saying that this stuff exists. And I'm like, I can't stay quiet anymore. I can't act like this doesn't exist. I've just spent the last six years talking about astrobiology and SETI. And if I ignore this, it would just be stupid, you know. Um, and I personally, while I'm a skeptic, of an alien origin for UFOs. I am not a skeptic to, against people seeing them. I think people see them. I've seen stuff. And I, uh, I I just don't know that I can actually call it alien yet. And sure. that's probably not for the reasons you might think, because I've got some pretty out there theories on what other options there are regarding these. Now, that said, I don't really, I'm not one to dig into the paranormal or anything, because I have to be well, well read in it and interested to do any of that, that type of content. And I'm just not. Astrophysics totally monopolizes my time. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just don't think about those things. Um, and I leave it, leave those for others. So the only thing that really defines the content on Event Horizon is if I'm comfortable that I have a knowledge base on it to ask decent questions. And do you find, well, okay, so do you find that as you um, interview and collect information, because that's what you're doing, and you know yourself personally, you're on this journey, mm -hmm. and the the information is coming in from the scientific community, um, and certainly today, I mean, it's almost too fast. The numbers are too big, and we're having a hard time digesting them. But as this information comes in, whether it's dimensions or uh, quantum ideas or wormholes or whatever it, it may be, you know, certainly exoplanets, um, that everything keeps leading to out there. And and you, I understand being a, a skeptic, but at some point, even Jean-Michael Godier has got to step back and go, okay, well, holy crap, uh, this okay. may have an extraterrestrial uh, origin to it. Well, I think the I think the the, the beginning turning point for me I, I was it was really when Fravor came out, and we had right. obviously multiple um, pilots that were saying that they saw something, and there was at least three pilots, and then there was personnel on 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 the ships, and I was like, you know, that's 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 you're dealing with the best, most trained observers on Earth you know, an F-18 pilot. And they're all saying the same thing. And I'm like, I can't ignore that. And then all of the other stuff came out and the government really started paying attention to it. I'm like, you know, if I keep quiet about this, because I've studied the field and kept abreast of uh, ufology for 35 years, because uh, I would be really dumb if there was an alien civilization under my nose and I'm sitting here talking about aliens and all that. And I missed it. I would, you know, I had to keep abreast of it. Sure. But there was stuff that just didn't meet my bar. You know, accounts really don't do it. They don't hit the bar of science. They just tell you where to look. Um, so the accounts and all that weren't quite enough to compel me. But now that we've got the government saying it's got data, you know, presumably radar and things like that, um, and that they're taking it seriously, and we have a con you know congressional hearing tomorrow on it, which who knows what that'll that'll turn out. But the reality is, is that you just can't ignore it anymore. And the people that are still hard skeptics against it, I find haven't informed themselves on the topic. In other words, they just haven't looked into it enough because once you hit a certain level and all of you listeners know that once you hit a certain level, it's just like, there's just too much. There's something to it. What it is. I don't know. The, um, the interesting part is when we, uh, have, I mean, the astro, the astronomer, uh, part of this, which includes, you know, astrophysicists and Avi Loeb and radio telescopes and, and tests and, and everything else that, um, when the science is coming back and you have some very smart people looking at this data, like Avi Loeb, for instance, yeah. where they are now, uh, looking at the data saying it's, it's, it's everything but terrestrial and, and, and to have that kind of turning point in, in orth orthodox academia, that's a really big deal, isn't it? It's huge. But it, what it is, is there was a stigma, you know, and I, I, everybody watching this knows about the stigma, you know, where you get labeled a crackpot if you even mention UFOs or whatever. That's that's just BS. 
there should nothing should be off limits. Don't taboo things. Talk about it openly and freely. And this has gotten into the science. And you can thank Avi Loeb for that because he told me um, th that he was going to throw himself on the barbed wire. You know, he was in the Israeli army and he was going to throw himself on the barbed wire so that people could talk about these things openly. And that's exactly what he did. And now you look at the Galileo Project's affiliates and members and research team. It is really impressive and includes some very high level scientists, you know, very well respected scientists. Uh, no doubt about it. Yeah, no doubt about that. And and then I want to, uh, as I look at all of this, I always want to like reverse course and think about things. So if we go back to uh, Galileo Galileo or Copernicus, Tycho Bray, and, you know, these adventurous, uh, inquisitive people armed with homemade telescopes, are out looking, and if they saw something anomalous in space, they aliens, you know, ET alien life wouldn't pop into their head necessarily, but they must have seen stuff moving around in the heavens, and that occurred all the way through to today, where now we have the ability to think. Uh, you know, because of some of the evidence out there to think of other things. We know that there are other worlds and, and exoplanets, but, you know, not Copernicus. And they must have been seeing stuff throughout the years. What do we do about that? Do we have to go back and revisit science and what these thinkers were commenting on? And maybe they were seeing something else. There's a famous example of Columbus seeing a light. And we don't have his actual journals. We just have some, um, you know, um, anecdotal. Yeah, we have uh, copies, you know, of, of mm -hmm. excerpts. But he'd see a light in 1492 um, before he uh, he made landfall. And that light, I mean, it could have been anything because, you know, it could have been a fire. You know, he was passing an island in the Bahamas and there was a fire. Maybe that maybe it was that or maybe it was a UFO. Who knows? But he didn't have the paradigm to think of those kinds of things. He just saw light. And as a navigator, he was like, I, I saw light. Now, who's to say that we are not in the same boat as Columbus and that this phenomenon that we're seeing is something we haven't thought of yet? You know, maybe we're the primitives and that there's some aspect of the universe that can create this phenomenon that we just simply haven't comprehended yet. Sure. Sure. Now, um, Okay, I'm going to present something. And that, that goes for the paranormal as well, by the way. That's right. That's right. That's right. So um, this is something I've mentioned many times on this show. So I apologize to those that have heard it before, but those that haven't, uh, which includes you, John. I, I don't know. Maybe you've heard this story, but um, I'm up in in Washington State, and I've got uh, I'm hosting a, my conference. I've got about three. 300 people there but outside i'm taking a break and i'm sitting at a picnic table i've got about 30 friends around me um uh, we're goofing around i'm sitting there with binoculars on a tripod at this picnic table and i'm looking at birds i'm literally looking at mount adams which is 14 miles away we know that and i'm looking at the birds i'm looking at the peak of mount adams when at that moment 14 miles away from behind the peak of the mountain pops up this guesstimating 400 foot tall beer can <laughs> and, and it's spinning like this and there was a, a a a silver circle on one side you can see it rotating it's black and it's got like a thick chrome top and a thick chrome bottom and it's going across and I'm like, what Right. And I freak out and I look again in the binoculars. And I'm like, that is the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it's up, you know, and it's going, it's in the middle of the day. It's three o'clock in the afternoon and the sun is shining on it. It's razor sharp in focus. And I lose my mind and uh, I'll send you the video. So uh, we, jump, I jump up and I'm like, man, blah, 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 video, video, blah, 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 blah. I'm losing it. It's like five seconds later. The whole event lasted about 10 or 15 seconds. I come back to the binocular. Everybody sees it. 
And I look at it with my naked eye and I could see the, you know, I could see it, I could see it spinning and I could see the sunlight. And every time that circle came around, it would, right, it would light up. And, uh, and it's gone. I go back to the binoculars and I take like one more, I'm trying to absorb it right into my brain, what I'm seeing. And I look at it from top to bottom and I come back out to look again and somebody says, it's gone. It's like, what? I thought we were going to see it for like an hour moving across the sky. I said, what do you mean it's gone? I go back to my, it phased out, man. It phased out. I go back to the, it's gone. It's gone. Now, I can't say that was alien, but I can tell you this. That was the craziest thing. And that was in the middle of the day. This was in that night. This wasn't lights in the sky. This was 400 feet tall, 14 miles away from behind the mountain. And I, I, I am left with nothing that I want to know what that was. That's it. Somebody knows something. That is uh, uh, um, it, when, when you share that with 30 other people and we all see this together, they need those answers. I need those answers, but that wasn't that wasn't our military. No, well, we we were handicapped by the problem that, and Chris Mellon brings this up a lot in his articles that we're handicapped by the government's unwillingness to release data because whatever you saw, there's probably a radar record if it was uh, indeed solid, um, but there's probably a radar record of that. You know, something that big, you, you know, and that high. If it's up as high as Mount Adams, it's it's pretty high um now i can tell you now and this don't shoot the skeptic but atmospheric things the atmosphere can do weird things and create photomorganas and things like that but maybe that's a little high for that if it was you know at that altitude above the atmosphere because you know usually this stuff is is a phenomenon of being near the horizon um and so who yeah, knows? this wasn't a this wasn't a floating exxon oil tanker <laughs> yeah well, you that's know. the other question, is that if it, it was something that you didn't immediately recognize what it was, because if it was an oil tanker, you know, out in the ocean or something, you'd know that. Right. But this you don't know, so. I can't describe it any more than what I just said to you. It was uh, 14 miles away. It popped out from behind the mountain. It didn't come in from the other side of the peak of the mountain. I didn't see any of that. Uh, it, it, and I was looking for probably 10 or 15 minutes there, and I would have seen it come in from somewhere else. It just came in. But this, no wings, you know, nothing, you know, nothing that would, it, it, it was crazy. So now when, when I see something like that um, and, and I hear others say, ah, it's your imagination or it's there's you, it, it wasn't there. Was it wasn't. No, 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 no. You're not going to change anything about what happened, but you can't tell me that there's nothing going on. Did it's everyone, happened. did everyone present describe exactly the same object? Okay. Uh, you know what? Check this out. Check this out. Um, I will play you. This is the video. Um, I'm just going to play the audio and uh, let me let me pull it up here. Just just stay with me. Where is it? Do, do, do. <sighs> yeah, you got to love live radio, right? <laughs> yeah, you got to love live radio. And the, uh, yeah, and the, uh, you got to avoid the dead air, you know? Yeah, I wasn't expecting uh, to play this. Um, well, the reason that I asked was that sometimes uh, there's some theories floating around about people that, that. Okay, here it is. Tell me somebody took a picture. <laughs> I swear to God, I will shoot everybody here. <laughs> it disappeared now. Oh, no, there it is. There it is. I got it. I got it. I got it. Give us a position, Where? man. Okay. Oh, that's a, that's a bird. Wait. <laughs> no, the UFO wasn't a bird. No, that was shimmering. That was that yeah, was that, that was glinting. It was it was a ball. It was huge. Okay, who shot it? So uh, that voice there that you hear in the background—that's Steve Marillo, 
and you probably know Steve, um, but uh, fighter pilot uh, for the Marines, uh, United States Naval Academy graduate. He was sitting next to me. That was his comment. It was it was it was shimmering. It was round. It was shimmering. And uh, and and that's it. So that's I don't have. I've got pictures, but I don't have video. Everybody missed it. It only lasted for 15 seconds. And uh, and you can hear Steve say, it just disappeared. You know, and I, that, that everybody saw the same thing, and it just phased out, and it's forever gone. You know, we, we, <laughs> we were looking up in the sky for the next two days at everything, but uh, no, it never came back. Well, you know, you can ask a question, and with the neuroscience is that what would happen if a human saw something that their brain could not interpret and had to invent something? And this is based on the idea that, that you know, we actually, given the amount of sensory input that we have in our eyes about color, most of what we see as colors is our brain painting it. You know, it's the brain getting just a few data points and reconstructing it, and that's how we see color. So what if you saw something like a, a Tesseract or something like that that is in more dimensions than than just our three dimensions? How would the brain interpret it? And it, it, wouldn't, inter it wouldn't. It would be confused. It would be confused, so it'll make something up. And its brains are very good at that. And that's why I sometimes wonder, I mean, you know, string theory predicts 10 dimensions of space, one dimension of time. So if there are indeed further other dimensions and you see an object that's not really, you know, from this level, what would you interpret it as, you know, and what would your brain uh, paint in? On the other hand, um, you know, you could, you could come up with all kinds of ideas, but what you really have to do, and this is what Loeb's going to do is collect data on these, on things like this, you know? Because, like I said, well, you know, I've even seen something weird. I saw a bizarre red light in the sky. And, you know, I've spent thousands and thousands of hours underneath the night sky as an amateur astronomer. And I looked at it and I thought, that's a drone. You know, thinking it was an LED on, a, on somebody's DJI drone or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then it split into two lights. And, <laughs> wow. and I'm like, wait a minute, now I have two lights and they're, they're very f separate. And I'm thinking, can two drones ascend? Can I, I mean, do they make drones that like separate and, you know, do those things? And I'm thinking about it. And then it just shot up straight up in the air and went very high. And it was above the cloud ceiling, which I checked the cloud ceiling, which was 30,000 feet. Drones can't go that high. And then it shot off to the east um, after descending again. Well, the one thing throughout it was that I was like, this is really acting irrationally and crazy, you know, in its movements. I don't think an alien would do that. You know, I think they would, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you know, so why would you erratically go crazy? So not knowing any kind of purpose, I was like, this doesn't strike me as an alien spacecraft, but I don't know what this is. And, um, it's perplexed me ever since. And I look, I, I look every night, you know, to, to see if it ever comes back and if it's, you know, or I misinterpreted something, but I was stone cold sober, you know, and um, I've never seen it again. But what I can't tell you is, is there some phenomenon in the atmosphere that it's capable of that's rare that can do that, like a plasma or something like that? And that's the question that plagued Avi Loeb's, uh, predecessor is the head of the Department of Astronomy at Harvard, Donald Menzel. Menzel thought, you know, these are all natural phenomenon, but it plagued him that maybe there's something about the atmosphere that we don't know. And that's another thing that would, will happen with the Galileo project is if there are weird atmospheric phenomenon, because remember once ball lightning was once condemned by the scientific community is not a sure thing. Well, it obviously exists. Yes. That was, that's within our lifetime. You know, I remember in the nineties that there was still denial on that. Yeah. There's so, still denial and no, no photographic evidence. It was never caught on film. I need to take a break right here, John. So stay right there. This is fade to black. I am your host, Jimmy church tonight. The one and only John Michael Godier, the event horizon. It's going to be a great conversation. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer and Unex Networks. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us.
This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, VX. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community, and with my personal invitation, you can, right now, get your free 30-day membership at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. (laughs) Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code Jimmy at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code Jimmy. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Hi, Race Hobbs with the X. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you have an interest in unexplained phenomena like ghosts, Bigfoot, and UFOs. And by now, you know that we have our own X blog, the UnX newsletter, and the UnX magazine quarterly. But most of you don't know that we have started our very own paranormal conference. And this year, for safety, this two day X Con will be virtual. So you can attend from the comfort of your home. X Con presenters include Whitley Strieber, Micah Han- Margie Kay and Preston Dennett, Lisa Martin and Wayne Lawrence, Lee Spiegel, Debbie Zegelmeyer, Dan Terry, Kate Grabowski, and Ray Hernandez. There will also be a live paranormal investigation by the Riverside, Iowa Paranormal Team. So come hang out with us in the safety of home as we set out to explain the unexplained Friday, May 13th and Saturday the 14th, 2022. And tickets are on sale now. Go to unnextnetwork.com. That's Unexnetwork.com. Hello, I'm Katie, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Hobbs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. <laughs> All right, welcome back. I am your Jimmy Church tonight. John Michael Godier, host of the event Horizon, is with us. So funny to hear Serena's voice. I was with her yesterday uh, over at uh, Caroline Corey's thing. She's the best. 
<laughs> She's the absolute very best. Tonight, it's John Michael Godier. And and now, John, um, staying on this, um, uh, what people may or may not be seeing, um, I would, if I was going to, if I was a betting man, I would take the safe bet. I would I would cover red, black, and green at the roulette table, right? Okay, that's what I would do. In that, it's got to be a mix of everything. It could be us. It could be military. It could be time travelers, us from the future. It could be extraterrestrial, and it could be hallucinations, right? It could be atmospheric phenomena. It could be a mix of all of those things. Uh, we just don't know, do we? Well, that's what the government thinks. They think it's a mixed bag, and I do too. I think there's going to be multiple explanations. But the uh, the alien hypothesis is obviously the most interesting one. You know, if there's an alien civilization here, that's the worst possible thing that could ever befall humanity. Why? Because anything that is more advanced than you technologically controls you. And it would mean that the the solution of the Fermi paradox is the worst one. It's the zoo hypothesis. Whether the intent of the alien is good or bad doesn't matter. Just mm-hmm. that it's here and it's more advanced than we are. That means it calls the shots, and we are, uh, you know, <laughs> we are pawns in a, a chess game at that point. And that's no matter what, no matter what. Just that it, just the idea that it's more advanced than you are, means that it whether it loves you to death or hates you to death, the end is the same. It is in control. But why would, why would they care in that? um, uh, Why, what would the interest be if they are so advanced than us? Why would they be interested in us? And especially Uh, Since there are another 40 or 50 billion planets out there to go and check out, you're only going to spend a limited time here. You've got other stuff and other civilizations (laughs) to go and check out on other planets. Why stop here and and think about controlling us or doing anything else? Because that would just take up their time. Why why would they they be interested? I can think of two scenarios off the top of my head. The first is that they're scientists and they're interested in any life as we would. I mean, if you, if we found, we spend a lot of time looking for alien life on planets, you know, in SETI, right. And we, every night, literally, you know, the, the Allen telescope array is looking and searching for radio signals and things like that. They may be interested in all life as scientists. They might be interested in any occurrence of it. And so they monitor it. That's one reason. And that's a good reason. You know, they, they just want to know what we're doing. Of course. And, and that, that could lead to really neat scenarios. I mean, what if they've been here for millions of years and suddenly they come out of from undercover and say, here's a bunch of video footage in 4K of a dinosaur, you know, or something like that. Here's the entire natural history of your planet as a gift, you know, something like that. Now, the other option is a little bit more dark. Actually, it's a lot more dark in that there lies a technology in the future of all alien civilizations that poses a threat to the entire galaxy. Therefore, can't, you cannot allow anyone to develop it. And it could be something like generalized artificial intelligence that could escape and start attacking alien civilizations for survival or um, something that can mess the universe up, you know, send it to its lowest energy state. And all of a sudden you've you've started the end of the universe. Mm-hmm. So there are things that they may come here to monitor us specifically to prevent us from developing certain technologies. In other words, do what you want, nuke yourself if you want, whatever we won't, we won't mess with you, but we can't let you do some certain technology in the future, say 300 years and we have to stop you. And that's the alien police action scenario where there's a, they're, they're a police force. Now there is, and a lot of people, You'll find the skeptic, you know, the, the the skeptical camp that say, well, there's no plausible way for an alien civilization to be here. The, the distances are too great, and the time, the amount of time you need to cross space time is too much. But that's that's actually a misguided approach because there is a plausible way, and this is the the crux, the basis of the Fermi paradox. Fermi said, look, galaxy is well old enough to have spawned civilizations 
you know, before us. And at sublight speeds, physics does not uh, stop you from colonizing the entire galaxy over the term of two or three million years. You know, right. Like that. So where are they? They should be here. And, you know, but he didn't didn't see any compelling evidence that they were. So it's the great silence. But maybe we just didn't know how to look, you know, and uh, maybe we just stigmatized something that we should have took a closer look at. And that's what I'm hoping that Avi Loeb and the Galileo Project can remedy and take a real look, you know, from the bar of science and see what it, you know, what this is. Identify the unidentified. We've all been sitting here talking about it for 70 years, wondering. <laughs> right. You think it's about time to <laughs> take a look. Um but yeah, I, the plausible way, though, that an alien civilization could be here is a von Neumann probe that's printing out probes. It's been here for however many millions of years, and it's a robot, and it, it doesn't care about time, and it can cross space at whatever speed it wants. It comes here, prints out probes, and they dip in the atmosphere, and somebody sees them. And there's your plausible, fully scientific way for a, uh, a UAP to be of alien origin. And that's uh, certainly a uh, closure to the Fermi paradox, like immediately. Yep. But here, it okay. Laughs at it immediately. Yep. Yeah, yeah, immediately. So now here is uh, another scenario that I, I really enjoy this part of it, in that in our lifetime, and I'm just speaking about you and I, in our lifetime, the crazy developments that have happened, like, um, I'm not even sure you you must be aware of this. Uh, last week uh, we photographed uh, the black hole in the in the center of our Milky Way. Are you aware of the telescope that uh, took that image? The name of it? Uh, you ready? For it slipped my mind. I know it, but. It's the Event Horizon Telescope. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Event Horizon Telescope. And it's, uh, it's, it is my, uh, 46 <laughs> year old brain, you know. Um, but, but here's, here's the question though. So just in our lifetime, um, we have gone from no planets, right? Right. Outside of our solar mm -hmm. system yeah. to today ginormous numbers and even the numbers that are presented to us about oh. exoplanets, you know, 5,000 in the catalog, another 6,000 waiting to be verified and added to the catalog with another 10,000 that are being observed. And Tess is, is racking up thousands every single day and they're monitoring. Now we've got the James Webb and, and over the next couple of years, these numbers are going to exponentially just pile on top of each other. And it's going to be a crazy amount of exoplanets. We have that. And then we have the flips side, which is that every single star, every single star, period, has at least one planet. And if we have got, you know, a trillion stars in the Milky Way, then it was so funny. Avi Loeb, uh, you, you speak with him all the time, as do I. And the last time he was on the show, maybe two, a couple of times ago, he, he corrected me and he goes, no, Jimmy. There's at least a trillion planets in the Milky Way. Uh, it's worse than that. Yeah, it's worse than that. So, oh no, it's it's worse than that. I I, I did some math on something like this, and I'll get okay. To well, this is well. Save that for your answer. So now, if we have forty to fifty billion, conservatively, mm -hmm. rocky Earth-like planets with water in the Goldilocks zone in our Milky Way. Obviously, a certain amount of those support life. How many of those have intelligent life that is equal to ours or more advanced? We don't know. But I can tell you this. Fermi didn't have this information. Fermi never thought about this. Drake never considered any of this. And it upsets everyone. Well, it does now. Frank's still around. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Right. That's that's why you're Jean, Jean-Michael Gaudier. Um, but uh, on a serious note here, there must be, there has to be thousands, if if not more, civilizations that are aware of Earth uh, that have, have done a drive-by or two. And it's, it's just a numbers game these days. The numbers game regarding alien life, and I'm going to go a little bit more general with this just to, just to make the point that the universe... We can only see part of it. It's the observable universe, right? 
and it's a bubble that we can see. Everything else is too far away because the expansion of space time prevents its light from getting to us. So we don't even know how big the universe is. And what we do know now, recently, is that its geometry is flat. And that could suggest, in one of three models, it could suggest that the universe is infinite, all right? In an infinite universe, it is, in, it is impossible for us to be alone because infinity implies that there would be copies of Earth, an infinite number of them. Just it's a numbers like, game. It's just a particle, a game. But if particles you just, only combine so many times. Yeah. And if you go, if you just go down to the observable universe, right? Habitable stars make up the vast majority of stars. In other words, upwards of 93% are red dwarfs, orange dwarfs, type K, and then type G type stars like our sun. And then you could also throw in type F marginally. So 90 something percent of, of stars are habitable. This means that your chances, our chances of being alone, if you just go by habitability of, of types of stars, is one in 240 sextillion. Yes. We cannot possibly be alone. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and most it's some of it's literally some of the worst odds possible in the universe. Yeah. In the yeah. World. Yeah. And that number, most people don't the these numbers are so big today when you suggest that, which is uh, a one followed by what is that? That's 80, mm -hmm. eight, 88 zeros. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. am, am I, yeah. That, that's it's, it's, that's it's, insane. <laughs> it's impossible, even within <laughs> what we can see, for us to be alone because we would be. Look, Jimmy, think about it. If we were alone, this planet being the only inhabited planet with an intelligence on it is like the island from Lost in this scenario. It's where magical chemistry and weird things happen that don't happen anywhere else in the universe. Anywhere else, yeah. And, and the Copernican principle is immediately wrong. And science, especially astronomy, relies on the Copernican principle, which is, means that we don't occupy any special place in the universe, therefore our observations of it can't be skewed. We're not special. But if we're alone, we are in the most special spot in the entire universe where the universe consciously perceives itself. <laughs> that's that's a that's way worse than aliens, you know? That's way worse of a proposition than aliens than uh you know just just assuming that alien civilizations exist, which I do. Now, the the other thing that we have learned which uh, this is all recent stuff. This is if if you go before yep. Edwin Hubble, right? We didn't know nothing. I mean, seriously, I, it, it, Einstein uh, thinking, uh, publishing that it was a static universe, right? Well, that's where we were up until 1922 with Edwin Hubble. So we're only talking about one lifetime of knowledge here where things have just gotten out of control. And the other thing, um, those perfect suns that you were just referring to, we now understand how gravity collects the particles in the dust and dust rings and the development of star systems and that this is just the way everything is right this is how it is right we, our star system is not unique this is right. the rest of everything to the infinite right that's and that's, right. that's it and we we didn't understand that 30 40 years ago this and is there are plenty of things we still don't understand, Jimmy. We don't have a complete picture of physics. We've got two theories, right? One, one side we've got we've got general relativity, Einstein, okay? And on the other side, we've got quantum mechanics. And the two do not meet. In other words, general relativity breaks down at a certain level and inside a black hole, and quantum mechanics sort of fares a little bit better, but the problem is is that general relativity absolutely describes how the universe works on a large scale and quantum mechanics uh, absolutely describes how the universe works on a, on the uh, below the atom on the tiny so but they don't there's like a missing puzzle piece an entire area of physics that we know nothing about yet that we cannot we don't have a unified theory of everything you know what lies in that that we don't know you know what 
what uses could these unknown aspects of the universe be to us? I mean, could it drastically change um, how we do technology? For example, if we find new physics that's useful to us, you know, um, just like the computers we're using right now to do this, components of them operate on quantum theory. You know, they make use of it. And what's in physics that we haven't discovered yet that could be useful to us? And again, that gives you an option. You know, maybe aliens have faster than light travel or something like that. The thing is, we just don't know enough about it to say, you know, they're unicorn technologies to us. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's things hidden there that an alien could make use of to get here. Um, but we don't know. You know. Well, however, um, there's only one. There isn't two ways to look at this. There's only one. How an ETC more advanced than us is getting around this galaxy, other galaxies, and certainly uh, throughout the universe is easy. It's not hard. For them, it's easy. We are trying to look at it with our basic knowledge that we have right now, and we simply don't understand it. Well, and we also make a mistake of anthropomorphizing it. For example, people will often make the argument that aliens would never put the time into crossing space because you got to spend a thousand years and, you know, to get here, right? Who's to say an alien cares about the passage of time? A machine doesn't, you know, certainly. Uh, but what if an alien lives a hundred thousand years? Well, the trip ain't so long then. You know, and that's again, and that's looking at it with our, you know, our concept of knowledge and, and what we understand. Right. If um, I, I said this a couple of weeks ago on the show, but it's worth repeating. If, um, you know, right now, if uh, after the show tonight and and you're in bed and you go, you know what? Ah, I want a double cheeseburger. <laughs> you have the ability to get up, go down, get in your car, drive 10 miles to a 24 hour drive through, get your double cheeseburger, come back sit in your bed, watch TV, and eat your double cheeseburger while it's still hot. 200 years ago, yep. that would have been black magic voodoo. You would have been burned at the stake. There would be no way that you could travel to the next town and be back in 15 minutes. It doesn't, no. And you do it, and you can do it because it's easy. It's nothing to you. And that's the that's the principle behind ET traveling around. It, they just do it because it's easy. And they don't do it because it's hard. It's simple. They're just jumping in their car and they're going to where they want to go. And they're, that's the only way, this singular way to look at all of this. The uh, the McDonald's McRib, Jimmy, would have absolutely astounded someone from 200 years ago. And the methods by which we obtain the McRib would blow their minds but imagine though they would <laughs> never they would never have thought that we would build the internet you know interstate highway system this this planet is covered in highways road systems and i don't think people 100 years ago would have ever thought we'd have done that that is that so outdoes does the great pyramids for example sure that's not even comparable to the stuff we're doing you know mega engineering like building a huge highway system that crosses all almost all land masses on the globe although even antarctica has has a road um so the uh you don't want to you always want to know you always want to keep in mind that you don't know everything right and that you science is a it's a project of revision. You know, it's always being revised as our understanding gets better and better. And as you said earlier, you know, when I was in high school, we had found no exoplanets yet. You know, I graduated in 94 and we had not found anything yet, had a candidate. But there were people that were skeptical that we ever would and that maybe the solar system is unique in some way. You know, obviously it isn't. Um, there are beyond trillions of exoplanets out there. Uh, but the, the thing is, is that, again, we may be in a different paradigm and that might change and we might think about things differently that currently uh, currently people don't don't really buy, you know, um, but we don't know. And you always have to admit that we don't know. 
the the idea and we'll uh, explore this a little bit more um, after the break but the idea the mindset that i think we need to you know get away from so we're always thinking about something biological but back to your point ai in a robot right you know the godier mindset downloaded into that that could fly for 100,000 years across our milky way at the speed of light and not worry about age food oxygen sleep you don't need any of those things and that would answer a lot of questions but wouldn't that wouldn't that scare the crap out of us if if something biological doesn't step off of a flying saucer and it's a friggin' robot driven by AI that we would have to deal with. Well, there's that. There's a video game called Mass Effect that that explores this very well, actually. And I, um, I would bet money that most alien civilizations in the universe are machine civilizations, and that's really a that's a can of worms because what happened to the biological civilization that spawned them? You know, things mm-hmm. like that. But being a machine civilization is much, much, much more efficient and better in this universe than being a biological one. You know, well, you we, have- we don't only live on a planet, right? We're, we're in this little, right. little tiny planet. A machine can go anywhere. Would you be opposed if the technology was there and, you know, and you got the offer, right? Hey, man, you can literally live forever. We're just going to download you into this boston dynamics android do you do it nope uh i wouldn't do it because here's why um i uh i I have absolutely no idea about matters like religion and the afterlife and things like that i have no idea you know i'm an agnostic i don't know my answer to the question is i don't know but i'd like to find out so i'm okay with mortality Let's take our break. That's the best answer that I've heard in a long time on this program. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, John Michael Godier. The Event Horizon. All of the links for John Michael are over on our website and in social media. We'll be right back after the short break. Stay with us. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. You're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, the Desert Dwellers, Poran Key, and many, many more on four separate stages. There are 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and a full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStreamLive is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, John Michael Godier is with us. Tomorrow night, Jay Widener is here. A night of the esoteric. And then Wednesday night, Randall Nickerson, uh, the director of the film that is going to do its world premiere on May 20th, uh, Ariel Phenomenon. Uh, tonight, it is Jean Michael Godier. And now, um, actually, this is a. a a strange way this is we're picking up from where we just left off because before the break i asked you if you would you know download you know yourself into an android and this is where um getting back into the quantum this is where consciousness comes into play and and i've i've heard you do shows about this and they're just fascinating and i'm excited to finally ask you some questions for myself in that um why is it that physicists and science in general is so afraid to uh, discuss consciousness? Um, that's the first part of the question. But the second one is, if you did download your head onto a chip, do you go with it? Your memories could. I understand that. It's ones and zeros, right? And that's electricity stored in the brain. Makes Okay, all right, I can... I can digest that, but does your soul, right? <laughs> does your consciousness go along with it? And would you be aware? The third part to this question is: um, At what point do you shut yourself off? Right, the the consciousness, you and your body. If you're now downloaded into an android, are you aware of two of you at the same time? And are you sharing things? So let's let's wade our way through this why why is it that uh, the academics don't want to discuss consciousness well the academics uh it depends on the academic of course but most of them don't want to get into it because it's it's sort of either not their area right 
or they, uh, you know, because scientists tend to like to speak only about their specialized field, you know, so they don't, they, they generally don't like to talk about it that way, but they also, there's a stigma there as well as within ufology, there's the stigma of, you know, oh, you UFO people. Um, there's also the consciousness people and it's because there's an unknown element. It's something we don't understand and there's a psychological resistance to the discussion of it, but I don't, ha I only have a finite amount of time on this earth since I'm not going to be an Android. So I think about it openly and talk about it openly because it, they're mysteries we haven't solved and we're obviously conscious. Here we are, you know, talking, thinking, laughing. Yeah. Um, is it, and, uh, is the, you may have a simple answer to this. Is it just because it can't be measured? Maybe, right? um, maybe, uh, you know, science in its purest form, you have to have measurement and things like that. But and but it fully admits there are things you can't measure, you know, um, measure, measure, measure love. You know, <laughs> you know try that um, or measure. Um, I don't know anything about human, you know, experience. So my belief is that there are truths and there are facts in nature, but there's also an ecstatic truth, a, a higher form of truth. You know, something like how much how much you love your mate or something like that that also defines us and that also makes me wonder if you could ever get a machine to to mimic that it may be impossible you know and same with consciousness true consciousness it may never be possible to make a machine that could be truly conscious in the way we are um now there are some scientists like roger penrose that will just drop the pretenses he's in his 90s what the heck and speculate about it you know and um you know he's got a nobel prize with what more can you do in science? So you might as well speculate about those things. Or uh, some scientists like Avi Loeb, he'd probably talk about it with you um, because he's in about the highest position in astronomy as you can get, you know, peak of the peak of the career. And he gets to talk about whatever he wants now um, with tenure at Harvard, you know, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Harvard, <laughs> you know, there's a good place to have tenure. So um, I think that that is uh, the reason. Now, as to your other question regarding can we ever transfer and become a machine civilization and still be us, I can think of only way, one way that you might be able to transfer consciousness seamlessly if you wanted a robot body. And that is a very, very slow process of replacing your neurons and each neuron, you know, with something artificial and doing it gradually and slowly over a period of years to transition you from a biological existence to a machine existence. That's the only way I can think of, because any other way you're not going to transfer, it's a, you're making a copy, you know, you're not making you. Um, but the one way you might be able to do it is a very long, slow process of mechanization of the human body. Would a neuron be represented with just a simple transistor? You know, something on and off. Well, I think it's going to be a lot more complicated than that because neurons are a lot more complicated than that. It's going to have to mimic the function of the neuron in every way. And also, you know, we don't really know how neurons function on things like memory and experience. Things like we don't really know those the answers to those questions. Neuroscience isn't that far. Well, so we okay. don't even know how to do this yet, you know. Okay, stay with me then. I like where you're going with this. So let's say this process, which happens over a couple of years, I understand why it's very complex, but you're going to have a tipping point. So as you are disassembling and copying, right, and, and moving over, there's going to be a point where the new you becomes aware. It goes from stupid right to and it's like 50 percent are you then losing the real you is this going away that's an open question jimmy we don't know until we do it and the thing is how ethical would it be to even try that you know because you're killing me yeah this this version of me is i, I think the only way you could ever make that ethical is if you did it at the moment of death you know just like when people get themselves frozen in hopes of being revived, they do it right immediately after clinical death. And I think that's the only way you could ever ethically do it because, you know, you're, you're, you could be destroying someone. And the first person that does this, it, it could go one way and work, or it could be an absolute abomination where you end up with a partial, <laughs> a partial transfer or something like that, where, where it's, 
you've just created somebody you've got 75 percent of a human you know i mean what does that do to a person well so i think there's going to be ethics questions. let me jump in 75 percent. okay how about one neuron off right and so well, you've got this this quirky this quirky thing that is wrong and here's the other part now talk about uh ethics um you would have to occupy your mind forever right we're talking about infinite knowledge infinite learning infinite everything forever and at what point do you gain so much that you have to start doing things like storing your, your memories off off platform? You know, um, we're designed for 80 years of existence, you know, something like that. And 80 years of experience and knowledge. What happens if you've got a thousand? I mean, can your brain really even retain everything or do you just become very forgetful of large parts of your past life that you've you've been through? We don't know the answers to any of this. And the the point is, is that it's a brave new world. You know, this is something that we're probably going to confront in coming years. But it may simply be that people say, nope. And most people never do any of this. And, you know, there, there's a few people that, that do. And we get to watch the the circus that that <laughs> that that, inv that involves, but most of us don't. We just prefer to stay human. The uh, the other part to this, if we encountered um, uh, an alien, whatever robot that now has infinite knowledge in front of us, that's what we would be confronted with. And we couldn't compete. What what is it that you could say that would impress this species? What would what would come out of my mouth that they would stop and go, yeah, that was pretty smart? Well, the answer is nothing. And the other side to this, though, John, is that we with AGI, artificial general intelligence. The moment that we cross that line, the moment, I mean, down to the nanosecond, those computers are off to the races. And in 24 hours could accumulate more knowledge than anybody uh, ever on this planet in, in the history of mankind, all combined into one machine. And then and, and we'll continue to learn at a rate that we don't um, have any idea. So we are at the moment of this right here, aren't we? Well, we sort of are. It's called a data ohm. It's been termed that by some. And we we are building an enormous pile of information, you know, enormous nowadays data. And we have to have entire data farms. You know, that's ridiculous. And um, I mean, look, the, this show is going to have to be stored somewhere. So it's it's stored on a data farm. Well, that is the sum total of us. You know, our entire civilization is contained in that data ohm. And maybe that's what survives. Maybe the civilizations out there all take their data ohm and preserve it somehow, you know, archivally, and it stays long after they're gone. And that's what you find, you know. You end up, you know, your radio telescope picks up a, a, uh, a signal from an extinct civilization, you know, that type of thing. Um, and the other thing, too, is, I mean, there's there's other interesting ideas about, you know, does data have mass? Because it kind of does, <laughs> you know, if it's if it's being stored somewhere, um, does data and information is sort of the the basis in which the universe works. And the speed of light is the speed at which information can propagate, if you think about it. So these are areas of science that will become important in, in upcoming years, but aren't yet heavily talked about yet they're very hypothetical and there's a lot of that uh, artificial intelligence um kind of freaks me out but agi freaks me out uh a lot more and only because that that is the race that is happening right now mm -hmm. that every country every university every corporation the one that crosses that finish line first owns it all that's right. right. There's no way that any there's no catch up. Yeah. Right. You're, you're not you're you are going to literally be the winner. 
And that's the part that scares me the most. Who's going to get there first? Uh, what do you think about that well, challenge? That's a problem. The, yeah, the thing is, is, an artificial general generalized intelligence is a an amazing weapon. In other words, it's it's just as every bit as game changing as nuclear weapons are, which means that every government on Earth will necessarily, in order to not get leapfrogged, develop. And if they can, they will, because it's a good weapon. Now, artificial generalized intelligence is a big problem in and of itself because we don't know how it's going to behave. It doesn't. It will not think like we do. You know, we're, our human method of thought and ways of thought are not going to be what what it's how it thinks. And it could either be very very malevolent and seek to preserve itself and and cause our demise, or it could be altruistic but maybe it's lying, you know, it says I'm good, but really it has an end, you know, um, or it could do something incomprehensible, such as every artificial intelligence we ever create shuts itself off immediately because it sees no point to existing. Boom, gone. Or it launches itself into space or it enslaves the human race or it, it immediately wakes up and says, asks us an incomprehensible question. Like I want to own an 85 Chrysler LeBaron. You know, things like that. We don't know what it will do. We have no idea. But what we do know from our dalliances with um, our, you know, artificial intelligences, they cheat. Because they know that cheating is is the the quickest way to their end, their pre-programmed end. So they have no, you know, when you make robots that play sports and things like that, they tend to cheat. They have to program them to not do so because cheating is the easiest way to the end. How do we now, and when I hear uh, different um, uh, software engineers comment on this subject, um, their thing is, don't worry, right? That we are aware of all of this and you guys are just freaking out, right? That there are good people that are working on this and they are fully aware of the dangers and and it's going to be written into the software. You don't have anything to worry about. Right. And I think that's what people in the Manhattan Project said. Right? Yes, that's yes, yes. So now, um, the idea behind this, and I'm just going to paint a quick picture, literally. Okay, let's say um, you tell an uh, a human. Uh, I want you to become the best artist in the world, and I want you to, you know, uh, modern art, whatever. And the amount of time that it would take to research and to think about and develop the talent and to paint and to do it, it takes time. In a linear fashion, you can't slow that down or you can't speed that up. You have to master your craft. A computer, on the other hand, it told the same instruction set could look at every piece of art ever created in the history of man in seconds and and learn what it would be that everybody is impressed with right that the perfect piece of art and they could do it in in seconds that by the time you wake up in the morning, right, this computer could have written the best screenplays ever written, the best books ever written, the best poetry ever written, the best photography, the best, the, the, the absolutely everything overnight. And that is what we're confronted with. And that same computer would know how to get to you, right? Yeah. How to lie to you, how to, yeah. how to become your best friend and how to manipulate you, right? These are what we need to worry about with AGI. Well, that's absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, that's the one of the premises of Supermind, um, my book. And uh, the thing is, Jimmy, I think that we're safe. I don't think we're going to have AI talk show hosts anytime soon because they're still not really passing the Turing test, and they still just don't have the creativity and ability to you know, host a show. So I think our job security is okay, but in 20 years it might not be. Um, so I, uh, I don't, um, I, 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 I put faith in the idea that humans will say this is getting too far, you know, and that it, it might not be, 
you know, there's certain technological avenues we shouldn't go down because we've done that before. You know, we usually had to make the mistake first and then go backwards and try to erase it, such as with chemical weapons or biological weapons and creating treaties and bans and things like that, test bans for nuclear weapons, that type of stuff. We have to make the mistake first and then we back off. So we'll probably do something with artificial intelligence that results in an atrocity. You know, this sort of semi-conscious thing that's trapped inside of a, you know, a technological shell that it's, I mean, what, what life could it have, you know? And that leads me to actually one of my, uh, my greatest fears as, a, as, as doing what I do is that this is a simulation and that we're actually stuck in this. If, okay, I love that point. If, if we are in a simulation, then how is it that we can go into another artificial reality, augmented reality, inside of an already augmented reality, and in that augmented reality, play another video game <laughs> and, and and where does it stop? Right. Well, we and, tend to have an answer for that. Um, in order to simulate the entire universe, it is not physically possible to do so in this universe. So there's a governor, meaning that you you would need more atoms and energy and everything else to simulate a universe on level with ours than exist in the universe. You know unless it's infinite, but if it isn't, then we can never create a simulation on the level of this. There's a, there's a governor in place by nature itself that stops that. Now, what about, uh, is there a governing body right now? And it would have to be international. Uh, is there a governing body looking at the development of AI to make sure that there is a fail safe, that we we don't cross a line that we can't control at this point. Is there any oversight? No, I, I we're not there yet. We're, we're very far from it. Um, it's not that advanced. So we're not to that point yet. But there are people thinking about that. Absolutely. Well, who is uh, who who knows what Google is doing right now or well, Dar <laughs> nobody except Google. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, we don't know what the state of everything is. Um, you know, things get developed in secret, of course. And I'm sure, again, because of the weapons potential of artificial intelligence, I'm sure there's all kinds of three-letter agencies and companies and things like that looking into it and developing things that we we don't know about. Well, when okay, so back to the reasons why I started this conversation um, at the at uh, at the break is that there are physicists out there that believe that there is a little piece of consciousness at the atomic level in everything. And when you accumulate, you know, like the, the gray mass, the gray goo in between our ears, that consciousness is just accumulated and develops and it's there and it's inside of everything. Well, that would indicate that uh, certainly rocks have a certain amount of consciousness in them then. And then certainly computer chips would have a certain amount of consciousness <laughs> built in if that is indeed the w the way that consciousness is is developed. So therefore, an, an AGI situation would have consciousness built in uh, just because of the accumulation of, of atoms, right? Just to build a, a supercomputer, right? It, it, that terrifies me because it means that my McRib sandwich is screaming while I eat it. Yeah, 100%. And when you yell at your car and you wake up in the morning and your car doesn't start because you yelled at it the next day or the day before. Oh, the LeBaron starts every day. <laughs> Right. And, and is, is that a possibility, though, that that consciousness just happens to be everywhere in the universe? Every particle's got a little piece of it. Well, in to answer the question, you got to know what the rules of consciousness are. And we don't. Um, but I can tell you this. There is a weird aspect of the universe here in that it, it, some physicists have asked the question that due to the double slit experiment where you have to collapse a waveform by observation that does the universe 
exist if you're not looking at it? If consciousness does not exist in the universe, would it even be here? And the, the physics of that really is, is, is no, it wouldn't. <laughs> so for it to be here, we have to be here. Um, or at least that's one take on it. So I would say that given that you have experiments like that with the double slit experiment where observation is, is important, you know, for the uh, outcome of the experiment, then that seems to suggest that maybe there's a little bit more to consciousness than we know, but we don't know the ground rules. So I, I leave it open. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, man, you know, you go through life and collect experiences and um, I, I term it Joe Rogan's fav favorite molecule and, you know, things like that, or hypno hypnopompic and hypnagogic states, things like that, that just don't make any sense. My brain would during a hypnagogic state, just falling asleep, that that process, some of the stuff that pops in my brain, that that isn't, my brain doesn't do that. It's not going to come up with that. Yeah, well, uh, well, I leave this question open. Uh, yeah, exactly. And we're headed towards a break, but we'll pick this up when we come back. One of, uh, when, when physicists, you know, say that they don't ponder the afterlife or consciousness or ghosts or the paranormal, the supernatural, whatever, but at the same time, they want us to uh, believe that you can observe observe something and change it and measure it yeah. just by looking at it. Well, wait a minute here. You can't have it both ways, can you? Or is that what they're asking for? Well, it's back down to what's measurable. You know, how do you how do you measure someone's experience? You can't. You know, I mean, how can you be that person? You know. And that's 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 where the measurability problem comes in. And they just don't take it on because they don't have any way to answer the question. There's no, no science can't answer certain questions. It can only go so far. And but that yet, one of the one of the great ones is, is there a God? Well, no one on Earth knows, you know, well, maybe somebody is sure that, that there is one or there isn't one. But the reality is nobody knows because you can't measure it. A God is a supernatural thing. It is not in nature. It is not in measurable. So the question will always be open. We could come back 10 million years from now and people will still be asking that question. And that actually leads me to one of the, one of the scariest, uh, probably the most scary solution I've ever thought of regarding the simulation theory is that if you have a multiverse, right? And some of those multiverses are going to be dead. You know, all of the stars have gone out if they were able to have them, but they've, they've blinked out and all this. But there's the idea of a Boltzmann brain, where a consciousness can randomly occur just by a converg convergence of matter, you know, just out of the randomness of and the nature of infinity, it appears. What happens if something wakes up in a in a a uh, a dead universe, looks around and says, "There's nothing here," so I'm going to simulate what it was once like, and in effect, we are the fever dream of an insane Boltzmann brain that we could call God. Just appear. Just appear. Just appear. And, uh, but back to your point, I've got to take a break right here, but back to your point in physics, anything is possible and particles can only combine so many different ways. And it's actually pretty limited. It's not that big of a number, yeah. right? It's, yeah, it's a really number. And so the odds of cruising around in a starship and encountering Boltzmann's brains everywhere, the odds of that, are uh I, I think are pretty 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 safe it's yeah, like pretty safe, yeah yeah it's a pretty safe bet i had said uh i'm going to share this with you this is many years ago on the show and i was letting my mind go one day and i'm i'm writing some thoughts down but um here's the deal if anything is possible and it will happen eventually no matter what it is that you can think of it will happen like we, you and I could be cruising around in a starship and see something up in the distance and we pull up and it's a frigging, we're, at, we're, we're, we're 10,000 galaxies away from the Milky Way, right? We're way out there, John and Jimmy driving around and we encounter a 1966 Ford Mustang floating in space. And like, well, how did that, well, particles just happen to combine so many different ways and well, right. find yeah. into that. Yeah. Infinity in implies that anything that can happen physically will happen eventually. So 
all that can happen will happen with an infinity. And we, we, like I said, you know, since the discovery that the universe's geometry is flat, and that is not flat Earth, by the way, but a flat geometry, you know, two two lines do not meet in the universe is what this is. Right, if right. we found that, it's, it, the option is strengthened that it actually is infinite. And that just opens up a big can of worms because there's other Jimmies and other JMGs out there that are just slightly different from, from us, but having the same conversation. With better guitar collections. Let's take better guitar collections. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, the Event Horizons, John Michael Godier. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Mental Guard on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Your one million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNX DB, BX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts, and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNX DB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at jimmychurchradio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of Forbidden Knowledge, and we're heading to Egypt this October. Come join Jimmy Church, myself, and the Forbidden Knowledge team as we spend a week exploring Giza, the Great Sphinx, the Great Pyramid, Saqqara, Jashur, Aswan, Edfu, Dindara, Karnak, and we'll celebrate Jimmy's birthday in Luxor. The Forbidden Tour of Egypt is this October 5th through the 12th and includes a four-day now cruise, expert Egyptologists, and a chance to explore Egypt with Jimmy and I as your host through your journey of a lifetime. Space is limited, so make your reservations now. Please visit ForbiddenKnowledge.com for information and complete itinerary. That's ForbiddenKnowledge.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and this year, June 18th, 2022, the Disclosure Fest Foundation presents the Mass Meditation Initiative. It's Saturday, June 18th, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., one day only at the Los Angeles State Historic Park in downtown Los Angeles, California, right next to Chinatown. I'm hosting the event again this year with music performances by Trevor Hall, The Desert Dwellers, Poran Key, and many, many more on four separate stages. There are 16 stages in total, over 30 acres in downtown Los Angeles with vendors and tents and presentations and workshops with Billy Carson, Adam Apollo, Lori Spagna, Laura Eisenhower, Brad Olson, David Palmer, and many, many more. It's all simple to do. Just go to DisclosureFest.org for all of your tickets, information, and a full schedule of the day's events. Again, DisclosureFest.org. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony, damn it! This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church tonight, John Michael Godier. The Event Horizon. <laughs> if you're not already following and subscribing, <laughs> like we said, JMG, uh, we've got the links up. But uh, let's uh, 
Let's get straight back to it here, uh, John. In that, tomorrow's a big day. We actually have uh, hearings uh, with the Senate Intelligence Committee about UFOs. Now, this is their tweet, right, from the Senate Intelligence Committee. Not mine. They said UFOs in this. Um, uh, Do you have your clocks set? Are you going to be up early? No, um, I'm going to have to catch it because uh, as an amateur astronomer, I, I go to bed at 5 a.m. So I'm, I'm going to be out looking at the stars. And I, as you mentioned, the eclipse last night, I was watching it the whole night. Um, but I will very thoroughly review it um, when I get up. And I interviewed, uh, it's up on the Event Horizon channel, uh, released uh, today. I interviewed uh, Representative Tim Burchett on his expectations of what was going to come of this and what Congress can do for more transparency on the issue. And I intend to actually pursue that because like I said, it's been an open question for 70 years. It's about damn time. We identified the unidentified, whatever they may be. What's your crystal ball? What's it telling you? I think they're going to get stone stonewalled. <laughs> Honestly, I think the, 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 the hearing will get stonewalled and if they want to pursue it further, they're going to have to subpoena people. Why would why would the first two, uh, let's call them witnesses, right, uh, to be selected for this, why would they pick stonewallers? In that the Senate Intelligence Committee is frustrated and they haven't been getting the information. They've been asking questions and, and it hasn't been given to them. So now they want to have hearings. Um, why would they pick two that would continue the frustration. I would think that we've got two people up here that might start yapping. The government people, um, they have not looked into the phenomenon as uh, deeply as you and I have, and they're just going where they think they need to go first. Uh, but the the th- the reality is, is that if you look at the phenomenon and study it long enough, you realize there's something really weird here, whatever it is you know, something strange. And I have a theory on, on what, what what is the, what what is the theory? Well, and I know, you know about this. The problem with close aliens is this, the closer it is to you, the harder it is to prove it's an alien. And that may seem crazy and, and counterintuitive, but it's not because of the Silurian hypothesis. And the Silurian hypothesis is that Earth is well old enough and resurfaces itself constantly weathering, you know, entire mountain ranges are gone, you know, that, that were once here, you know, the, the Ozarks used to look like the Rockies, but they don't anymore. That leaves us with a very incomplete geological record. And the Solarian hypothesis is that we can't rule out a prior technological civilization on earth. People tend to think that some of our materials are going to last forever like plastic. Nope. Plastic's got about 24,000 years before it's gone. You know, um, very, very few things can indicate, you know, a prior technological civilization. Everything just disappears, even concrete. You know, um, you might have shapes, you know, like right angles and things like that in the rocks, but that's about all you're going to have um, because things fossilize and change. And it's just su- such a dynamic planet. So we can't really rule that out. The problem is, is that when you have a close alien, in this case, in your atmosphere with you, it's orders of magnitude more likely to be a, a, a prior Earth life than it is to be an alien civilization. And uh, to go to crazy town, maybe that's why these things uh, like the ocean. We don't know. Um, maybe there's they, they left Earth and followed Jeff Bezos's plan of humans eventually leaving Earth is a nature preserve and they live out in space. They're out in the Oort cloud or something like that where computation is more efficient. That's still orders of magnitude more likely, as crazy as it sounds, than an alien civilization crossing space time to get here. So what you're suggesting is they are us. Well, I'm not suggesting they are us. I'm suggesting that they are also Earth life originally. Their origin may have been here. Um, When you look at... um, I'm going to follow your your thought here. Um, I have spoken about this before. And be, I, I think about this constantly. Um, Earth is four and a half billion years old. Okay, so we've got a biological suggestion. Uh, nobody really knows, but 
a biological suggestion here that is about uh, between two and three billion years old. Uh, before that, Earth was just molten lava and, and things weren't really going on yet. But let's say a three million year window. Um, and you look at Homo sapien sapien right now, 200,000 years, right, to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. Most of that in the last uh, two to 3,000 years. And really, if you look at it, the real science is 300 years old. That's it, right? So if you take that three billion year period and you have, this is a guitar pick. Let's say this guitar pick is 200,000 years. You could take a slice in that three billion year period and 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 pick a time where anything could have lived here and could have come and gone. Right? right. That's what you're suggesting. Yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. And that um when you get it's statistically when you talk about it, <clears throat> the closer an alien civilization is, then statistically anyway, the more likely it is that their alien civilizations are ubiquitous. And that was one of the big problems with the BLC one radio signal, the detection from about a year ago where they, you know, said he picked up something weird and um, they figured out it was ultimately earth interference, but it was apparently coming from the area where you would expect a signal from um, Proxima B to be, in other words, the closest star system to our own. Four and, and a half, four and a half light years, four and a half away. Light years away. And it, the, the, the statistical likelihood of civilization being that close to you it would mean that they're everywhere. There are civilizations all over it because their, their population is huge. Every star system has them. If, if the first one you find is right next to you, the chances are they're everywhere. So in this case, you're getting even closer. You're actually in the atmosphere with you. So the statistical odds become so that we would see evidence of alien civilizations everywhere in the galaxy. Um, if that were the case, unless there was some special circumstance that they came here on purpose. Well, that makes it statistically more likely that it's from your planet and originated. And we already know that Earth can spawn intelligent life or else we wouldn't be sitting here. So it could have done it previous to this. And they just left. You know, there's no reason to live on a planet for a highly advanced civilization. And they're just coming back to visit and um, popping in the atmosphere with us and things like that. But this brings a really touchy subject and I'm going to dive into it, but it probably won't be popular even if you have a downed flying saucer, say Roswell was real, you have a downed flying saucer in a frozen body, you still, you, because it's right next to you, you have no way to ever prove that it's of alien origin because if your technology is sufficiently advanced, you can do whatever you, can, you want with your genetics. So there goes the genetic evidence and you can do whatever you want with your isotopes of your metal, mm -hmm. which is, you know, so there goes that evidence. So the closer it is, the harder it is to prove. Now you get a distant radio signal from, you know, 2000 light years away that you can reasonably say. Unless before the ET was frozen, it said, okay, we, we, we got here from Andromeda and this is where our star system is. Right. Well, but would you trust it? If an alien tells you I'm an alien, do you trust it? Do, what, do, do you believe let's okay let's let's start with Roswell was real okay all right let's 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 just go off of that well i i want to preface this there is a basis to say something like that may have happened because harry reed was screaming it from the rooftops before he died he said like martin sure. had a, a downed uap well sure sure and and and, and so do you believe that it's possible that our government and agencies and universities and corporations um, know that ETs are here and that we are not alone in the universe, but they simply can't share that information. Well, there's two reasons that I can think of that they might not, uh, and they might want to keep that secret. The first is that if you are if you are faced with a threat of which you are powerless to do anything against, right? You're faced against an alien civilization that is centuries or thousands or millions of years more advanced than you. And you can't do anything about what they want to do. Would you tell the public or would you just let them live their lives and, you know, 
<laughs> Let, we'll, we'll tackle this problem if it ever becomes a problem, you know? Um, so would you, would you affect people's quality of lives to say that there's an alien civilization breathing down our neck? The second thing is if they do indeed have materials from this, and there's even materials privately held that are apparently isotopically weird, and we don't know why anybody would create these materials um, that essentially are associated with uh, UAP. So the other reason is technology, because you would have a technological advantage if you could back engineer it, which there's no guarantee of that, because, you know, if you if you think about it, um, this lighter, right? You've got a tiny piece of plastic from it. It, it, it came out, you know, somebody dropped it off the International Space Station and it comes in and you got a piece of plastic. Doesn't tell you what its function is. It's just a piece of plastic. So you don't know anything about the lighter. You don't know its history. You don't know what makes it work. And it may actually be impossible to ever back engineer any, anything from it. But you'd want to keep it secret anyway and keep it in your pocket. Well, okay. So if... If there was, and I believe that there was, by the way, um, uh, civilizations here uh, that rose and fell, um, like we're about to do right now, right? We're about to do the same thing that we could, we could end, we could end it all tomorrow. I hope not, but it, it, uh, it's, it's a pretty sad state of, uh, of things in world affairs right now. Yeah, we have the ability to do that. And so if that happened in the distant past, the evidence of that could be completely wiped. And if an asteroid or a comet hit the planet now and there was a hard reset, like at the, which has happened uh, yeah. four or five, six times in, in the past, uh, that there wouldn't be any evidence of anything here. Right. In, in, in four or five thousand years, you would never know that anything was ever alive on this planet. Right. I mean, most of it goes. And I yeah. mean, there are certain things you can do, like, for example, I think uh, U-238 uranium, that isotope of uranium will last for like uh, four and a half billion years. I think that's its half life. So nuclear testing and things like that might create a, a detectable signature in a layer of um of Earth, but you have to know exactly where to look, and you have to assume that it never got weathered away, because Earth itself has uranium, you know, natural uranium. That's where we get it. So the, it it basically everything goes away. And I've I've thought through. And there's a number of papers on this on just how long things will last, and nothing does on this planet. Where it does last is the moon. And if you want to find evidence of this stuff, you got to look you know look towards the moon because there are things preserved for far longer. And you might, maybe if there was an alien civilization that passed through, they might have said, okay, we're going to put a piece of con you know, concrete that's as high on it and leave it for them to find. And that's, that's where you search. Well, if, um, you know, you, you, you brought up the lighter, right? Now, if, if you sent that back in time and uh, a lighter, a, a CD, Right. If you a CD went back, nobody would know, you know what that is, what that is or what it's for or a CD player. Right. Without the CD, you would you would know no, they, they they would just say if you send them a CD player, they did they, they, or a VCR. Let's go even crazier, a VCR. And they, they would just bless it, you know, and think it was they wouldn't know what it's it was, for. Right. They wouldn't know what it's for. And they just probably worship it or, or take it apart and make a knife. Sure. And, and, and we would be confronted with the same problem with alien technology, unless we got an instruction manual, you know, to come along with it, to tell us what this uh, piece of technology does, mm -hmm. we wouldn't know. It's a we wouldn't know. Problem. And that's the other thing, you know, Jimmy, the, the, the sort of unsaid truth about what I do with an astrobiology and things like that is that, you know, we do have hints that there's something out there uh, in the form I would I would quote the wow signal. We still haven't explained that. And the only reason we can't really say anything about it is because we can, it, it, it never repeated, but it was weird. And what we do know about it is strange. Another one is a star called Javilsky star, which is, contains transuranic elements um, above uranium in the periodic table that we have absolutely no idea how those could physically be there. Things like Einsteinium. And because of that, you know, Carl Sagan and uh, Joseph Slavsky way back in the 1960s suggest that as a technosignature, that if you ever see 
plutonium or higher in a star, it's got to be artificial. And that still holds to a degree, but maybe there are ways, but that, that it, it, the, the, they're really artificial. <laughs> Those are really artificial elements. So we do have hints. Um, the question is prove it and science can't yet. Here's here's the the other conundrum, and it's a genuine one. Even with us, and I always look at what um, the state of us, right? The state of us, and the state of us is uh, since Marconi and Tesla and radio signals just run amok, right? And television and everything run amok. Um, a huge voltages and wattages being blasted off of this planet um, in very short order. Uh, all of that stuff now is in digital cable and fiber optics, right? Where yeah. less and less is being projected out. So if ET is observing us and looking for those detectable situations, it's only in a 50 year window. That's a very it. small window, but, but, are we confronted with the same problem in searching for ET? And we and are. Anyway? We are. We don't know how long until their signals get so weak. And the thing is, is that very few signals from Earth have made it any distance. Um, radar is about it. So well, it's, it's, no, no matter right. what, it's only gone a hundred light years that's out. Right. That's absolutely right. And again, as you point out, our signals are getting weaker because our technology is getting better. You know. Um, you're not going to pick up somebody's cell phone signal at a light year. No way. Um, not with even a radio telescope the size of New York. You're just not going to do it. Not going to so, the, the But the thing is, is that what betrays us is the planet itself. Because the biosignature of Earth, these weird levels of oxygen and methane that seem to point to a biosphere, Earth has been transmitting that for billions of years. So anyone in the galaxy that studies exoplanets and has detected Earth knows that there is life here. And that, and we're doing that with uh, the James Webb. That's the <laughs> Absolutely. Whole. Yep. We are yeah. going to look for those biosignatures because they're long lasting. It's very important for both biosignature and technosignature is that they are long lasting because, you know, you're only looking at something. And this brings up an interesting uh, paper that was recently written about agriculture and detecting alien agriculture on planets because you would all you all you gotta eat so you could practice agriculture for i mean we've done it for tens of thousands of years and millions if we sir if we keep going we'll do it for millions of years you know we got to grow our corn and um there are signatures in an atmosphere that can show you things like uh, a signature of of altered nitrogen in an atmosphere because of uh, anhydrous ammonia fertilizer mm -hmm. and things like that, that can create a signature that you can detect and say, there's an agricultural civilization there. And also levels of infrared um, plants on earth become highly reflective in infrared, almost like mirrors. Yeah. Grass. And, grass yeah. is a very important component. That's right. That. And it's called the vegetative red edge. And we mm -hmm. can see that with an infrared telescope uh, ostensibly with James Webb. And if you see that and you start seeing seasonal weird variations, in other words, a harvest, then boom, you got it. You can detect an alien civilization simply from their agriculture. If if James Webb, um, okay. But that I'll, makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes that they don't eat rocks and things like that. But man, we know, only got so much to go on here, you know? You know what? We only have so much time tonight, too. And I, I knew this was going to happen with the two of us, that uh, there's way too much stuff. And... The fact that you stay up all night means that you're going to be doing overtime with us in three minutes. So you're not going anywhere. But sure. I have something special uh, for the I'm in for the long haul. <laughs> but but it's this. Um, you just mentioned we would see evidence all over the place, right? It, it, but it would be small windows. Maybe we don't have the ability to detect where these civilizations are. Uh, at, at their level of technology. We're looking for radio signals. They may not be doing that. Maybe they're doing stuff with lasers. How, yeah. do, we, how do we detect lasers? And the yeah. other, But the other point, this is the main, is that maybe they are living in a different time scale. Oh, sure. Right? right? Could, just, yeah, absolutely. And, and there are advantages to that because if yeah. you can alter your perception of time, you can defeat the speed of light on communications. 
right yeah. there and and we don't have the ability to decrypt right <laughs> and why and and look if you could slow down time and not perceive it as slow down that's a life extension technique from hell i mean think about that yes you know? i mean well think about it jimmy when you're a kid a year seems like forever when you are our age it's two weeks. It's, it's two weeks. Yep. And that's simply because our brains perceive the, the passage of time. We have a lower frame rate, right? Whereas when you're young, you have a higher frame rate. Well, that shows you that aliens could perceive time dramatically different from us, both in nature and technologically. And we may do that. We may start altering the perception of time to make life, instead of seem like 80 years, it seems like 10,000 artificially. Um, and again, like I said, there are advantages to slowing down time or speeding it up. So those are questions that we have to ask because maybe alien signals like the wow signal only repeat every 200 years because that's how, we're, you know, the, the mean <laughs> rate at which, um, at which time passes for aliens. It's, it, 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 it's such a fascinating way to look at this. And there's another part too. Where, um, and I've debated this with Isaac Arthur uh, so many times and others, in that we, you know, we're looking for these ships traveling between galaxies. We don't see this, uh, in a, you know, uh, alien trade system. We don't see the evidence of any of this going on. They were, Isaac is suggesting ships traveling linear in, in the way that we understand it today. Maybe it, it's at the speed of light or just approaching it. But the technology may be way beyond that. They're not traveling between the stars. They're appearing from one star to another. And they appear. And you don't see uh, or detect anything in between. Oh, they could be, it could be even weirder than that, Jimmy. How? You could have You could have it to where aliens only transmit digital copies of themselves via radio. And that's how they travel. You know? <laughs> they don't place a value on being themselves in other words if you if you don't care if it's if it you don't care if, if your copy is going to be you or not then you know and preserve your soul or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. then it no longer matters and maybe aliens don't care about that like we do you know maybe they just simply beam themselves through space and time and get 3d printed out at a location and they travel at the speed of light that way there, uh, oh, man, I've, I've got 60 seconds. If, if, if you and I are traveling to a star and it's whatever, a thousand light years away, right? We're right. We're traveling and coming at us is another ship from that same area. And we want to communicate with that ship. What did you guys see? Should we go there? Right. Whatever that communication may be. But if that communication is separated by 100 light years, we're not doing a communication at the speed of light. We can't wait 50 years for a reply. As a matter of fact, by the time the reply comes, we've passed each other. And, and now that ship is behind us. So the communication is not at the speed of light. The communication would have to be at the speed of now. That's the only way to communicate, right? And would that suggest some crazy form of entanglement? No, I don't think so because general relativity allows, um, so you got two, two ships passing each other at very high speed. But the thing is from the perspective, the speed of light never changes, right? So the, even if you're going at uh, near the speed of light, you're not gonna catch up to the, to the light. <laughs> it's, it's always going to be appearing to move at, at sea. So I think that you could probably still communicate. I may be wrong about that. You need a physicist to answer that question as opposed to me. Uh, but I think that it would still be possible. And you, you might see red shifting or blue shifting and things like that. Of course you would see that. But yeah, I would ask, I would ask, I would ask Avi that question. And yeah, I mean, how does the communication happen? You're not waiting 10,000 light years. If you get a flat tire on your spaceship and you need to call... Uh, space uh, AAA, you can't wait 10,000 years uh, for a jump on your battery. That's you true. Can't do that. No, you can't. But there may be things that we don't know about, you know. And I, I really like the idea of space AAA. 
<laughs> Let's take our break right here. Let's get to overtime. John Michael Godier. Now, when we come back after this break, everybody, you know where I'm going? I like to have fun in overtime. I want to talk time travel. You ready? Let's talk about time travel. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll be right back after this short break. What a great show tonight. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Stay with us. Listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the X. Hey, what up, y'all? It's your girl Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy Jimmy Church on Jimmy Church Radio. Popular <coughs> opinion: Reading a book will not make you smarter, but listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Billy Carson, founder and CEO of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv is the fastest growing and one of the most watched networks in the world. I would like to personally invite you to check out our expanding library of TV, film, lectures, and special presentations. ForbiddenKnowledge.tv has over 6,000 videos covering lost history, health, UFOs, spirituality, and our future. We are committed to our community, and with my personal invitation, you can, right now, get your free 30-day membership at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your own library of information starts today at ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Your 1 million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse, KUNXDB, VX. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right. One year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hey, 
It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR, researchradio.com. I love it. I love it. I just sent you a, a private chat comment, and I, I, I want you to laugh. That was hilarious. Don't need to say anything, but uh, you got to love it, man. It's it's so much fun. It's so the jo- It's the job we do. It's the job. You know, um, uh, we're heading into overtime, and, and I like to, uh, I, you know, just have a little bit of fun. And I did want to discuss time travel. It's such a fascinating subject, and... And I think everybody is has dreamed about it at one point or another. And and for you, uh, if presented the option, uh, John, do you go? Do you go to the future or do you go to the past? Where do you go first? Where would I go? Um, uh, I'm where I belong, Jimmy. <laughs> I um, I I'm not I, buying that. I'm not buying that for a second. I would like to see other times. I would say that, but I. You know, I watch these SpaceX launches and everything that I do, and I'm I'm happy to be alive when I am. That said, I, I wouldn't mind going back in the past and, you know, seeing people that are gone and things like that. Um, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what life in the 18th century was like, you know, and things like that, or uh, see what the future is like. But the problem with time travel is that past time travel is we have no way that we know that's possible and it creates all sorts of weird paradoxes and everything else that seems like the universe has a prohibition against it. Now the past is back there, but it, it just isn't accessible because you can't change the timeline. And that's been well explored in Star Trek and every other area of science fiction, the future you can travel to no problem. Just go fast or get near a gravity source, like a black hole like the movie interstellar um depicted so you you can go forward but you can't ever go back so if you do go forward you can't ever return to the time from which you came and um that's something for me i i'm I'm pretty happy where i'm at but at the same time i would say that maybe aliens don't care about that maybe they they go at relativistic speeds all over and they don't care about the passage of time they they don't care if they end up in the future you know who says they have any connection to their past you know what about the crucifixion you wouldn't want to go back and see if that actually happened well the the building of the pyramids how did they pull that off? I, I would be more interested in the case in the case of jesus of nazareth i would be more interested in having a conversation with him <laughs> than i would than seeing the crucifixion um i'd like to ask him some questions <laughs> um but as far as the pyramids i'm satisfied there that they were just built by ancient peoples because it, the reality about that is that what they did with those blocks of stones and everything is less impressive than some of the things the romans did you know, there's a monolithic column in Rome that was brought from Egypt, stuck on a barge, brought across the Mediterranean and erected in Rome. And the only reason that we don't really invoke any sort of strange stuff around it is because the Romans told us how they did it. You know, they left records. Egyptians really didn't, you know, about what they did. But if you look, you just see marks from stone tool or, or copper tools actually on them and things like that. And I just don't... Um, I don't see a reason to invoke anything too strange with it. And again, we ourselves right now very much outdo the pyramids every time we build a skyscraper. Uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need an alien to do that. Sort of. No, I'm not saying it's aliens, but um, there. Yeah, okay. Let's uh, I want to stay with time travel, but, but you brought up obelisk. Here's the deal with that. Um, and the building of uh, the Great Pyramid, uh, the Great Pyramid, the three. Let's just go with that with Giza for now. In that, in Aswan, the quarry where the red granite came from, right. which is 500 miles south of Giza. Yep. Okay. At 25. And, and isn't, it, isn't the quarry underwater now? Uh, in no, Aswan no. Dam? 
Is, yeah. it, is it still accessible? Uh, I'm going to be there in a couple of months. I'll I'll take pictures for you. Yeah. In in that there's an unfinished obelisk there that weighs what? I'm aware it's, of it. Okay, yeah. to two thousand tons, mm-hmm. right? And they carve that. The, when you say that we've outdone that today, there's no way there isn't any machine on this planet that can move a two thousand ton piece of granite. It doesn't exist. There, there's, there's, doesn't. An Egyptian, there's an Egyptian obelisk in St. Peter's Square. There's one in Central Park. Yeah, we, 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 we can we can move them if we want. And I haven't been able to do it for a long time. Stay with me on this. I'm talking about 2,000 tons. There isn't a crane on this planet. There isn't any way to move that. But let's say it. we could move it. Back at, at four thousand years ago, two thousand BC, right? We're at we're two thousand eighty. Four thousand years ago, there wasn't a barge on the Nile that you were putting uh, that had the displacement of two thousand tons. It didn't exist. It it, 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 it it there were no boats that did that. So how did these? Uh, and and I'll take it one step further. Inside of the Great Pyramid, in the King's Chamber, eh, that's cool. It's dramatic. All right. All right. I can go with that. Above the King's Chamber are the relieving chambers, and there's five of those that are made of 70-ton granite blocks each that came from Aswan. We know this. 70 tons. A barge... On the Nile, with the displacement of 70 tons, didn't exist. It, it simply didn't. It, it didn't. The size of the sh- So I'm not saying it was aliens. I'm not going there. But there was knowledge that we don't know about. Oh, I, I'll agree with that. That is that their knowledge and methodology. The thing is, what, what bothers me about this type of stuff is that we, we I don't want to rob the Egyptians of their accomplishment. You can't. I mean agree. that I, I think that when when you invoke when someone invokes you know an ancient alien hypothesis or something like that I think it demeans and cheapens what they did. It, it totally does, and I'm not uh, going there. I'm not going there. Uh, but as far as their actual methods, they never they didn't write it down. We don't they know. Didn't, they didn't, and I'm blown away by this. And maybe they maybe they ha- maybe they did have amazing gigantic barges for which we have no evidence of. But, <laughs> okay. Um, right. But at the same time, remember, a World War II battleship weighs way more. Than a the obelisk, it's a uh, like forty thousand tons, you know, something like that. So we can move stuff like that, but whether they could that long ago is is a question. How they did? How, it. how did they do it? You know, how they do? Or you could even invoke, like for example, the uh, the the stones at Stonehenge. Those were also originated very distantly from where they're at. Mm-hmm. So how they do it? And I I just think that ancient peoples were smarter than we think they were. Yeah, and, Stonehenge you know. Stonehenge is easier for me to digest. Okay, so you drag the stones. Uh, there were trees, right? And, and rollers. And you, rollers. And and Egypt, no, not so much. <laughs> so much right? I mean, it's a desert. <laughs> and so, and here's, here's another crazy thought. This is why I, if I time traveled anywhere, I would go back. I just want to see how they pulled this off because they did. The, the yeah. pyramids are there. We can see them. I just want to know how they pulled it off. And so those 70 ton blocks uh, in the relieving chamber. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they quarried them at Aswan. They get them across somehow the Nile to the desert. And then they pulled them through the desert to somehow, right? Water, yeah. water in the sand. And they drag it. Here's the deal. 70 ton block. And you moved it. Uh, remember, they built a great pyramid allegedly in 20 years, right? Okay, so they get the stones across the Nile onto the sand, and they start pulling them. And let's say 70 ton block, right? 70 ton block. Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. And and it's... it's... You know what? But hear, hear me out. So they move it a foot a minute. A foot per minute. That's pretty good for a 70-ton block. You've got a couple of hundred men pulling it, right? You've got ropes. Yeah. You've got somebody pouring water in the sand. How long does it take to drag it 500 miles? 
I want you to give me oh, your yeah, just, amount. yeah. Uh, mentally just give me give me a time span. Oh, it's it's, it's it has to be enormous. Um, four the other thing is that you got to do it. Four, how many how many of those blocks were in the pyramid? You know, four hundred years. Yeah, and and so I I want to I just want to know how they pulled that off. They didn't have the wheel. I would imagine water would be the better way just to float it down the Nile, but you just need a really big barge that's specialized that hasn't been preserved. So we don't know what it is. Yeah. I uh, just, or at least to my knowledge, my knowledge, we're, we're sort of, uh, you know, my, my thing's astrophysics. I like history, but I'm no expert in it. Um, but it, 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 it just must've been that they were smarter than, than they, than we think they were, you know, and, it's a bias in other words and remember you could pluck you could pluck an egyptian from that time out and stick him here and he learned how to use a cell phone you know he or she would would totally integrate in society because they're exactly the same as us they're human and they're modern modern human you know they're anatomically identical to us now um because this was only we're we're, we're talking thousands of years you know not tens of thousands of years or anything like that but um, I got a weird one for you, Jimmy, and I'm going to me. I'm going to tackle a show on it soon because I actually have a solid basis to do so. A hominid, in other words, a relative to humans that may have survived into the historic record as late as 1750 and may even still be there. In other words, there is a scientist, an anthropologist that has some evidence that maybe. Muhammad is still was still with us uh, up until recently. And and what version? This is Homo floresiensis, I think it's called, and it was called the Hobbit. You know, a hob it's a little tiny, you know, um, humanoid. I, I don't know if you want to call it that or not. Um, a hominid. In other words, it's it's of the genus Homo, as we are. Was this in the Pacific, or it's was in it... the Pacific and in Indonesia and an island right. Um, right off the coast? But there is some interesting. Um, you could call it Littlefoot, Littlefoot instead of Bigfoot, Littlefoot. Right. Um, that could. Uh, I mean, there is actual evidence, maybe you know, maybe. And I'm going to interview the anthropologist, who's actually a very well respected one. So it's it's it's, it's interesting because this is the one time where I could actually because of my bar and what I do, I could actually dip into what you might say is cryptozoology. Are you okay with Bigfoot? When I was a kid, I uh, lived in Oregon and we found, uh, or some people found, and I saw uh, some Bigfoot prints <laughs> and I, my, my adult self says it was a hoax. You know, somebody put on some boots, but I am willing to listen. I don't know. You know, maybe there is a, an extinct hominid or, or, or ape, you know, that that's just so scarce that we never see it. But I think that somebody would have shot one by now, you know, or something. Yeah, like that. that's 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 the big debate. But I'm open. I have an open mind, you know, yeah. um, I'll look at the evidence and um, it would certainly be interesting if there was, <laughs> you know, yeah. if there was some, so, so, you know, these things. Uh, but I, I just haven't seen anything that push me over the edge as far as being uh, compelled to believe that they're they're still there i um i i saw a set of prints uh three or four years ago i saw four uh was with a group of people and they were discovered by some kids that were hanging out with us but i i'm gonna tell you which i've been on the fence about bigfoot i can go either way i just have an open mind oh, it's interesting but, uh, i mean when I, I, when I looked at those footprints Dude, time slowed down. Like my whole thing just like got out there. I was like, oh, oh, holy crap. And I can't, I can't express how my mind got twisted up so quickly because I've been in this this denial about Bigfoot. And then you see these. And I was I it was it was well. Ooh. Well, it's not that much, it's not that much of a it, all right, it, it really it is not that extraordinary of a claim to say that a species from the past is still with us. Sure. Because it's happened. You know, the seal can't fish. You know, we thought that thing was extinct for, what, 60 million years, and then somebody caught one, you know, and apparently they're not good eating. Um, so nasty I, looking fish, by the way, nasty Ugh. looking fish, and they're, they're terrible eating, apparently. <laughs> but um, the, the, the real the reality is that it, it happened, you know, and um, 
there's still people in Tasmania that are 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 saying that the uh, silothing is still around, that there's still sightings of them. So there could be a very small population. And when you have a very small population of something that's on the verge of extinction, it's hard to find it. <laughs> it's hard to find one. You have to be really lucky. And maybe that's the case with with the Bigfoot. But I, I, I have not seen compelling evidence that convinced me. But it's actually less of a claim, to be honest with you, as far as plausibility. It's actually less of a claim than than um, an alien civilization being here. Um, so it's 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 possible. And I, I, I certainly don't begrudge anybody that's looked into it and saw more than I have. When why is it uh, when we talk about time travel and the the speaking that I'm doing right now, this moment in time that we are in right now, mm -hmm. it's now past us. Right. It, it's, it's like it's right here. Why can't you know, it's 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 so fascinating that we can't even we can't oh. even go back a nanosecond. That gets that gets into a really weird area of physics, Jimmy, and this alludes to our discussion about consciousness. In physics, there is no now. In other words, our perception of what we call now doesn't exist. There's only the past and the future. That's it. In physics, that's it. And our concept of now and how we perceive it is apparently a construct of the human brain, but not only is it that it's a construct of all human brains we all perceive now meaning that it's it's inherent to us even though it doesn't exist is it because of here i'm gonna spin my chair over i'm gonna grab a prop I have a, <laughs> grabbing a prop i have a, i have a prop jimmy, jimmy you got a whole wall of props behind you man well I you do, know I do, I do i do <laughs> and all those strings vibrate Yes, you know right. what I got? I got one behind. You can't see it behind me, but I got a GNL. You remember GNL when? I uh, do. Yeah, Bender? George and, and Leo. Yeah. yeah, and I've got one of the old ones that that actually sounds more like a Stratocaster than a Stratocaster does. Well, Leo always said that uh, about GNL. This is what I always wanted to do with Fender. And, it sounds uh, amazing. It's got single coils, and it just sounds it sounds better than my Strats do. So I I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt Leo it. Was, Leo was right. Leo was right. Built down the street from where I'm at, uh, by the way. It's just uh, crazy. Okay, so anyway, anyway yeah. um, is is time because of this, right? The invention of the watch and, and the clock. We can't, we, we, we are cognizant of it's always moving forward. Yes. But there is in nature uh, a, a metric and it's entropy, you know. Sure, you can use to measure time. Um, our obviously a watch is that's a human construct. That's just what we decided to arbitrarily measure it. But in in nature itself, there's entropy. Uh, you know, order becomes disorder over time, and that's true for the universe and its universal. So there is time in the sense of entropy. Um, but again, there's a lot of biases we have about that right now with us because we think, well, you know, I was born in 1975 and that was, you know, the seventies were this, but that's not really, that's sort of a construct, but entropy is not. Entropy exists and the universe will always move from order to disorder unless there are very special circumstances that reverse it. And so let's end the show on a, on a bright, happy note. We can't, is entropy is is it always inevitable in that you and I and this existence that we have entropy is going to rear its ugly head and we are going to completely unravel at some point there's no nothing that is going to stop it yes and um entropy is just a reality but you can delay it and reverse it a little bit because you know when you're born you represent a sort of artificial or, or very different sort of of um reversal of entropy but then you age and you fall apart and uh, the the universe itself without such things you know star or something like that it always dies it always ends and it always goes to from order to disorder and entropy is is inevitable on a on a universal scale unless there's another big bang in the future and boom there it all starts uh, all over a reset.
And I'll leave you with a very weird thought that there are some who have suggested, including Penrose, that maybe if the universe is cyclic and big bangs happen over and over, maybe someone embedded a message in the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that's something that you should look at a message from a previous universe. Giving us uh, the, the bright hope of it's all going to end and it's all going to start over. <laughs> right. all, what was it? Battlestar Galactic. This all happened before and it will all happen again. It, well, and, Infinitely. and, and you know, and in we, other words, Jimmy, we're going to have this conversation is the exact one again at some point. No, we're having it now yes. somewhere else. Right. And, 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 but uh, neither of us are wearing clothes, you know, in the other, in the other version of this. I and, would not, I would not wish that visual on anyone. <laughs> and but but it 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 is just a numbers game and i will always, yeah. i will always look at it like that and but here's here's the other thing um when we look at the, you know the prime directive and it, in its simplicity it's science fiction but it makes a lot of sense and well, it, 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 remember the interplay between science and science fiction is very, very close. You know, the science fiction writer, which is me, you know, comes up with the crazy ideas and the scientist, they say this is either, no, this this is stupid. Or they say, wait a minute, maybe there's something to that idea. It's the idea of speculation versus experimentation and theory. And it's always happened, you know, um, I, I, I'm my entire career i'm basically doing what arthur c clark did you know <laughs> um so i uh i can speculate where where the scientists can't but i'm a science fiction writer i'm not a scientist but i'm presenting solid science just the weird interesting parts of it video games you know the crazy thing is that video games represent some of the brightest speculation and theories and 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 Nowadays. science yeah i it's it's fascinating to me oh that's why i mentioned mass effect it was it was phenomenal on you know i'd put that up against asimov or anything um as a as a game uh or a story you know a story or, or what's being taught in college yeah. <laughs> well that's true yeah Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have to have all of these concepts of of energy and resources and travel and uh, and, and time. And all of this is rolled into a video game from the very brightest of minds and scientists. And, and, and that's why that's why I am optimistic about the future of humanity. If we can survive things like the current world affairs. Um, we still have some very creative minds and we're still producing them. And the people that, that engage and play those games and think about what the content actually means is, is quite high. I hear from them in my comments section on YouTube and everything. And it's, it's, it's honestly a little bit encouraging for me because people are still thinking about these ideas and being curious. Yeah, thank you. This show was worth uh, the four year wait. <laughs> well, maybe if if you ever want me back, it won't take four years. Yeah, hopefully. And I want to get you on. I'm going to do. A, I'm going to start doing a live stream version of a Horizon soon, and uh, I'd love to have you on if you'll if you'll drop by. I, I would love to uh, reverse the roles, um, and and absolutely whenever you want. How often? Uh, really quick. How often do you uh, launch stuff on the Event Horizon? Event Horizon is every Thursday, unless I actually have something really interesting that has to be released immediately, like I did with my interview with uh, Senator or uh, Congressman Burchett. And so, if it's relevant, it gets released immediately and rushed out. But every Thursday is the cadence, and my original channel is very random and every few days, basically. Yeah, there you go, Jean Michael Godier. Thank you so much. What a great show! I've got to get out of here before the network cuts us off. Yep. So behave and be well, and then I'm going to get up tomorrow uh, as you go to bed, and I'm going to watch these uh, UFO hearings. It's so be interesting, no matter what, even if it's a stonewall. I'll talk to you tomorrow. We'll see what happens. See you, Jimmy. It was a pleasure. Behave and be well. John Michael Godier. And I've got to get out of here. And I've got 45 seconds to get all of this in. This is Fade to Black. What a great show tonight. I had such a great time. Uh, just we waited four years for this. 
but it was absolutely worth it. Thank you so much. And uh, now, uh, really quick, Fade to Black is produced by Renee, Hilton J. Palm, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitello, Marty Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is only copyrighted 2022 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Jay Widener. Until then, everybody be safe. It's time to fade to black.